big. His, his, his name is Malcolm. <laughs> And we feed him gravel. Oh, God. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful life. Oh, my dears. It's not quite that time of year yet, Chris. Oh. I'm not doing it's a wonderful life yet. No, no. We don't record our Christmas special till next no. week. You know, I mean, I, uh, what? No, it's life. I once auditioned. Uh, one of the last jobs I auditioned for down south from me back up was a stage version of It's a Wonderful Life. Oh. But it was unpaid. Oh. Um, and it was above a pub in fucking somewhere in South East London that you had to get a train to. Okay. Um, oh, right. Uh, so it's, but, one of those, it's one of those where you're like, yeah, this could be fun. Like, you know, short run. Like, this uh, could be a laugh. It's like, see, it's well, unpaid. Uh, well, I don't, I don't hate that if but, I can do it in my free time. And it's going to take you four hours to get here. They wanted oh. radio experienced actors because they were basically just mounting the radio version on stage. Oh. That's not how radio translations to, to stage work. Yeah. The hell? Yeah. I'm making this muffin in disgust. <laughs> well, the muffin's taste it, but what I've told you is disgusting. Clarence, I want to live again. Oh, just, I was, I was On like, stage! I was is that the tagline? I, like, <laughs> I want to do this fucking job. <laughs> I didn't get it anyway. I don't know why. Because I was fucking great. You are fucking great. But, um, yeah. It's weird. Aww. Weird job. I was like, no, we're, just gonna, we're doing this one of life, but we're just going to do it as stage fishing. All right, whatever. Because I, I was I was auditioning in the room with two people, two of the production staff, and then the director was on Skype in New York or something. So I was like, I guarantee uh, you, they were not in New York. They were in a fucking bedsit, uh, like, like by Watford, doing something else. And they yeah. say that to appear important. Yeah, so it makes, it makes us look better. Ah, oh, fuck off. I guarantee that the amount of times I've worked with people who who have been directors or whatever, where they've Kind of like, oh, you know, I'm going to meet you for that, but well, I'm doing this first. And they yeah, just name yeah. drop something, and you go... Oh, right, okay. Right, that's... I mean, that has nothing to do with... I just said, you're free this afternoon. And you said, yes, but uh, only this afternoon. Tomorrow I'm doing this, and like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't care about it. I'm asking if you're free this afternoon. Do you know what I mean? We just go, what, what you trying... Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to impress? Me, apparently. Yeah, but why? They didn't. But why? Unless you're going to hire me and you want to be like, hey, look at my cool so life. Got... Why are you wasting my time and your imagination? And it would have meant I'd have been down down in London over Christmas as well, which I didn't fancy the sound of. Yeah. No fun. No. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Big Dumb Cast, yeah. everybody. Um, Where we talk bitter about we, our failed careers. We piss um, and moan about the industry. Yay! That shatters out. Uh, speaking of shitting us out, I'm, <laughs> I'm Christopher... Haraldo's amazing cape, Johnson. And I'm Matthew, the face of Preparation H, Watson. <laughs> Ooh, what fa- What expression does the face make when the H is, is it depends applied? What stage of applying it you're at? Very good point. Pre pre application, application or post application. It goes something like. <sighs> The PAP. Those are the three stages. Yeah, yeah. that's good. The P, I saw the I P, I saw the A, and I saw the P. The PPAP. And if it's a suppository, <laughs> then it's like. Oh, it, oh, don't fall out, don't fall out, don't fall out. Clench, clench. Oh, we're good. Yeah, your jaw um, did lock for that. Yeah, that was, don't, I was, it's quite scary. <laughs> it's because mine just slipped out. Uh, oh, hey, hey. Speaking of uh, slipped out, I, we could God. segue filth all day, really. Well, we really can. Um. We've got some stuff to talk We've got about. A little bit to talk about nothing amazing, but we're <laughs> going to talk about it in an amazing way. Hell, let's, yes. Let's 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 um. Bin collection day has moved to Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, uh, let's move over. Let's, we've got a little bit of uh, new stuff coming up. Um, coming at you like a beam, like a ray. Got, um, so apparently they're going to reboot Shrek. Why? <laughs> With the same cast. <laughs> why? I don't know. And in other, in, other, in other why news, Vince Gilligan is apparently working on a Breaking Bad movie. Again, I question... Why would you do that? I don't know. That Purge Amazon TV series has, has, uh, has been renewed for a second series. 
have no idea what that's. I've not watched any of it. So I was no gonna say, like. fine. I guess. I mean, I think it translates better to TV as an ongoing narrative yeah. than it does to continuous movies. Maybe I guess. But, um, uh, yeah. Apparently, a Walking Dead movie is in the works. Oh, three. Yeah, oh, yeah, because um, three and 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 they Andrew they they, they don't specify it. Uh, but because I was like, what film? Film? And the more you look into it, it's television movies, but they don't elaborate on that. I think because they're doing that vague wording thing so they can judge the reaction to it and then push for a theatrical release or not. Yeah, but they're basically saying that... But, but they're, they're, they're starring... Andrew Lincoln's Andrew finished Lincoln. yeah. in the show now. Minor spoiler alert discussion, maybe, guys, for The Walking Dead. No one's watching anymore. Does he no die? Watching. No. He gets wicked off in a helicopter to further adventures. Oh, my God. So... They so just take him out of the show. He wants to leave the show to spend more time with his family in real life. Yeah. Because, of course, making that show is like an all year round Yeah, well, he's British. He's not American. Yeah. yeah. So he wants but to... he's obviously gone, mm, leave a back door, just in case. And toward the end of his tenure, they've gone, yeah, you remember that just in case? Do you want to, like, book a just in case <laughs> now and we'll, we'll organise three films, Andrew? <laughs> That's just who's who they gives call a shit me anymore. Three film, Andrew. I've seen a lot of posts this past week or so. People going, "Well, that's me done. Walking Dead now. I, I, I'm I, not interested anymore." I stopped caring about the Walking Dead at the end of the first season, mid series two. I went, like, "What am I, just, I doing I with my time? What am I doing with my life?" Um, it I became it became a joke at Halloween Horror Nights. Halloween Horror Nights yeah. um, in 2012, which is the last time I've been there before this year in in Orlando and Hollywood. They added the Walking Dead. It was a really cool house. And there was a bit of a scare zone, like the area in front of it was sort of Walker themed, and it was really cool. And then they brought it back for every Halloween Horror Night up till last year, and every year it became the 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 fan thing to go. Oh, here we go again. So even like there, it became a really we're doing yeah. this again. Yeah. Um, it's so strange. Like The Walking Dead is the ultimate in water cooler television. If that water cooler was full of Lucas Aid and this was the late nineties, like no one really cares. <laughs> Like back in the late nineties, this show would have been the biggest thing on television, genuinely, and everyone would have loved it because it'd be amazing that there, there was a horror gore show on every week. Yeah. Um, but we have more choice now. We do. And it's just so boring. It, yeah. it plods. It's Compa- so like, dull. It was like last week when I, when I was talking a little bit about the Exorcist TV show, oh. which I've watched a little more of now. That that does not make. You, I, I was wrong. I'm only five episodes in, <laughs> oh, and, and we're into the exorcism. We're Christ. straight up into the titular exorcism. <sighs> They don't waste they fucking don't time. Around, it's yeah. only like a ten episode season. I've finished. Um, I've just finished season three of Daredevil. Yeah, that has some of the best action hmm. and like the most visceral violence I think I've ever seen on a on a TV show. Walking Dead doesn't cut it. It's dull. It does not cut it. And I come from that annoying camp of well, the book's better, but it's true in this case. Yeah, but I got bored me. of that as well for the same reasons I, I read like the first 80 odd issues and I, I loved it I, I gave I, up. and I really like I broke it down like I sort of ploughed through the first 40 which is like yeah. volumes 1 to 6 something like that I ploughed through the first 40 devoured yeah. it um, like flesh and and really enjoyed it because the way they pace it the way the characters you spend time with them the way that nothing happens in the comic works well because you spend more time getting to know the people yeah and giving a shit about them as people and not as cannon fodder. Like the book really does have you in that Game of Thrones kind of sense of anyone could get written out of this at any point. Yeah. And I don't want any of them to because I either really like them or I'm interested in their relationships with others or I'm compelled by what they're going to do because they're not a nice person and I'm, I'm interested to see where the story's going to go with them and things like that. The show, everyone's just... Right, even even when I left it in like mid-series 2... There's only about two or three characters you were like, oh, they're interesting. Yeah. They're interesting. Oh, they're kind of, they're kind of, all right, there's more I could do with that. I'm not but even they sure how many of them are still alive. But they stretch it out as well. Yeah. Like, um, again, it, series one is, I think, eight episodes? Six. Like six episodes. That's it. Six episodes. Six issues is the first story arc. Mm-hmm. It adapts the first story arc, except for issue six. Uh, it, 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 in issue six, it bumps the events of issue six into season two, yeah. which is Shane's demise. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense for the TV show, because you want to carry on the tension between Shane and Laurie for a bit longer. You want to play on that. True. Um, Freaking, what's his name? John Bernthal's an amazing actor, so keep him around. Fair enough. But they replace it with an entire episode set in a lab. 
where they learn what the virus is. But and, hey, they got Clancy Brown. They explain. Yeah, but still, they explain what the Walking Dead is. What? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Like in the book, that revelation's terrifying. It's in like volume four. Yeah. They've been in the prison for like a book, and one of the prisoners they encounter is a serial killer, and he starts killing off the younger members of the group. He murders two young girls. And they find him, and they, they, there's this br- brilliant moral stuff where they're like, right, throw him out there. Like, we're not killing him, like, we're as bad as him. We'll throw him out there. That's as bad as killing him. He deserves it. And it's like this really big moral thing between the group. And it's the first time everyone's really butting heads. But at the same time, they have that horrible moment where I think it's Tyrese and Rick have to go and clear up the bodies. Like, yeah. To the bodies. And when they approach the head of one of them, it starts to move. And it hits, and he mulls over it, like, for, a, I think, like, a night. Like, they, they don't say anything, because they're like, like, what does this mean? And then they just come out and say it. They're like, it doesn't matter. We're all going to no, be he, like them. After Before he says that, he yeah. goes back and he digs Shane up. Oh, no, well, then after, 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 he's, after he's found it out, yeah, yeah he drives back Shane in the middle of the shot. night, digs him up, tells him he forgives him, and then shoots him again. Puts him down. Like, puts him go. down, and but then buries him again, puts the cross back up, and leaves. It's like, oh my god, there's some amazing storytelling shit going on here. This is so good. Um, but it's just the pacing, whereas the show, it's no appeal, man. It's boring. It just, it, if it yeah. was six episodes a season, I think I'd dig it. You know, six hours a year to commit to another part of the story. Fair Jesus, enough. They'd never get away with that. Yeah, well, it was like, what, like 20 episode seasons, that kind of yeah. shit? Just, ugh, it's, the, it's the network TV problem of having to fill out a season yeah. without having the money to do so. Yeah, and also really changing the characters. I love me yeah. some David Morrissey. That ain't the governor. The governor in the book is a really unpleasant individual from the moment you meet him. And in this, they go with the whole like charm offensive of like, hey, don't worry, I'm the good guy. It's going to be great. And then Moore's revealed. And it's like, what made him compelling in the book was you were like, how can there be a villain in a book about zombies overrunning the earth? Like, this is bad enough. Oh no, they can do bad guys. But, but Negan, right? No. Nope. He's really cool, right? No. You know, he's, he's in Tekken 7. Oh, Christ. <laughs> is he Tekken 7? How's that for guest characters? I could play him then, because we bought the Game of the Year I edition. I think might be DLC. Well, we, we got the, the, it came with the season pass built in, so oh, okay. if I put it back in, I might get to play as Negan. What's I thinking? He's got his bat. It's called no, it wasn't, Lucille. Yeah. Isn't it cool, guys? He's, she's a vampire bat. Oh, Jesus. So Walking Dead's getting that... three films for some reason. Let me tell you something that'll make you smile. Uh, Shrek's getting a reboot. Nope. We've been there already. We don't oh, know. Is, that, um, is that not a good story? Deadpool 2's getting re-released, which we know. Oh! It's getting re-released to PG-13. Yes. In a new in a new version. <laughs> and Ryan Reynolds has been out there talking about it. And... Um, <laughs> He's been out there talking about it. And he says, and he says, um, this is him quoted in an interview from uh, Den of Geek. He says, Fox has been asking for a PG-13 basically since 2006. Now, I've said no since 2006. This one time I said yes on two conditions. Firstly, a portion of the proceeds have to go to charity. Okay. Secondly, I wanted to kidnap Fred Savage. The second condition took some explaining. So... Basically, one dollar from every ticket. Wait, wait, wait. Former child actor Fred Savage. Yes. Why? Well, one dollar from every ticket sale is going to go to the Foot Cancer Campaign, which for the next few months being renamed Fudge Cancer to... So they could put it on the Deadpool 2 re-release marketing. Okay. And new scenes have been shot out to bulk out the softer edit. I'd heard about that. In the last few weeks, they've reshot stuff. Where, he, where he's like sort of taking the mick out the fact that it's a sanitised version and things like that. Yeah, it turns out that's a, a framing device... Yeah. A Princess Bride framing device with Deadpool reading the story to an adult Fred Savage in his bedroom. Oh! <laughs> which Fred Savage said, of which Fred Savage said, while my participation on this film was anything but voluntary, I am happy to learn that Fudge Cancer will be the beneficiary of this shameless cash grab. That's amazing. That's actually amazing. So it's only, it's only currently... Um, uh, scheduled for the US but we might get a UK release date at some point but, I would um, see that gives me the incentive to go watch it because this goes that's back, almost like a new film basically. this goes back to the the year before Deadpool's release where parents were petitioning and getting angry and all this stuff that Deadpool wasn't made for their kids like I can't take my kids to see it okay to which of course like Fox and Ryan Reynolds and others had to say 
you're not meant to. <laughs> but your kids shouldn't be into Deadpool. And even if they are, they should be a savvy enough kid and you a savvy enough parent to know that you're not getting them in to see the movie. Like... Wait till the home release if you guys want to show it to them. Yeah. But you're not getting them in to see it at the cinemas. It's an R-rated movie. It's not going to happen. And yet, people persisted. Very, uh, very significantly, Grace Randolph, um, sometime comic author and host of Beyond the Trailer and stuff like that. Uh, Ooh. she tried to... I wish, I wish, I wish I thought that I way. I that is, I'm sorry. She used to, she was the first host of Marvel's The Watcher. When Marvel did the Watcher, she was uh, uh, blonde hair, very kind of uh, loud delivery and oh, all stuff. delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but which is weird because it was like she was never a thingy. She was never a host. That was sort of like her first hosty thing. Yeah, like she was a comics writer. I've, I've got issue one of a series she did called uh, Superbia, which was actually really good. Um, but like, she she really petitioned hard for Deadpool to be PG thirteen on release. And she like kicked up a fuss to try and make it happen, because she was like, you know, this character, this character is enjoyed by kids, and kids should get to watch. It's like these kids shouldn't know him. Now Marvel is partly to blame for this. Oh yeah, because they because they have been pushing. I mean, the comics, fair enough. The comics is a subjective thing. I th- I I imagine that kids who buy a Deadpool comic the, the comics are, are generally... aware they're reading something that's meant to be yeah. for someone well, a bit even, older. Even the mainstream comics, they're generally aimed at teenagers. Yeah. So, but. Yeah. Deadpool's been popping. Deadpool pops have been, I think, two episodes of Ultimate Spider-Man. Yeah, and started appearing in the games and things like that. Yeah, and that's where it's like that's where the lines been blurred. But still, because they love that money, they love that uh, that sweet sweet Deadpool money. Well, which wasn't Sweet Sweet Deadpool money at that point. It was just a bunch of really exaggerate cosplayers it was going, sweet. We love Deadpool! I'm Deadpool now! Look, I'm going to super awkwardly sweet, hug and, and hum, dry hump everyone money. at this convention because I'm Deadpool. It's like, please stop. Um, <laughs> please, please stop. Or I'll help you cosplay please. as Deadpool. Or I'll help you cosplay as Headpool. Please! Uh, for the non-Deadpool reading uh, listeners in our audience, he's a decapitated zombie head. Anyway, the point is... For those who don't understand sarcasm in our audience, I'm not actually implying I'm going to kill and zombify our audience. No. For those zombies in our audience, uh, I didn't mean to use you as a punchline. Please don't eat our brains. (laughs) Also, have you heard they're doing three Walking Dead TV movies? (laughs) You might want to audition for those Have I got the TV movie for you? (laughs) Um, But the fact that... So so they didn't cave then and there was a big stink and this, that and the other and la 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 and cinemas had to put up like notices... On their tickets desk and a box office is saying like, don't bring anyone below the age of whatever to come and see Deadpool. It is yeah. not for them. So like, if, like, you're, if you're doing it, you know, viewer discretion is advised. It's almost like, like there's a rating system in um, place which tells you what age um, people should be going into these movies that people completely fucking ignore. Yep. Uh, now, when they announced earlier this year that Deadpool two was going to get in a second release, uh, a PG thirteen certificate. I did think, oh, for God's sake. So they finally got it, kind of, like two years later. But then we yeah. saw that news the other week that they were filming additional scenes for it instead of just neutering it. Which Because technically, there is a PG-13 version of Deadpool 2. It's the version that they'll hand to TV networks to start showing like next year onwards. Yeah. Because American TV, no matter is what it... time of the day you're watching it, unless it's networks you pay for, like HBO... Everything's edited. Isn't there everything's a, edited so it could be played at any time? Isn't there like the a day. joke PG thirteen version on the on the Blu ray which is like ten minutes long or something? I think so, yeah. <laughs> on the, the for the first film. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's on the first, is I, think it the first it's on, I think it's on the first yeah. one. Um But like that's the do you know what I mean that's the that's the way America operates, is that like you'll notice even in late night shows they don't swear. Like it gets bleeped out like crazy and things yeah. like that. They just don't do it. Unless They're it's very it. prudish, but they love killing black people. Yeah. They love supporting uh, racism and, yeah. and, and um, you know, what's it, like 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 brutal violence against minorities, but, yeah. you know, but they, they, love, they, they hate swears on the TV. But they love preaching inclusion and, and Christian charity, but if you're, if you're a brown person, then they put armies at the border to stop you from coming in. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. yeah. Just, lock, just lock her up, lock just, her up, lock her up, but just, don't say fanny on television. Just, just Americans. Yeah. 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 To all, all our American, American, to all our American listeners, we know we know not yeah. all of you are like that, but 
In fact, we we know a lot, a lot, a lot of you definitely aren't like that because you've come out and kind of proved that you don't yeah. want people to be like that it's anymore. A, it's a deeper societal issue, and yeah. we have versions of that stuff over here as well. You're not alone. The whole world is kind of shit. Yeah. Da, da. But Fun if nice. this gets a theatrical release, I will definitely go see it. Yeah. I, because I, I knowing that I they've do, knowing that their wraparound narrative is literally the Princess Bride and Fred Savage is involved, I I will go and watch that. Because that's got to be... You, you know they've done that, not just because, like, you know, oh, we're sort of doing it to fill in some blanks and remove some bits and this, that, and the other. They're doing it so that parents get a kick out of taking their kids to see it by getting something aimed at their generation and mm. above, which mm. is amazing. Um, I just want to know they're going to get around the, uh, you know, the... bit and the... stuff and the... Because uh, that's going to be hard to cut around. Narration. <laughs> I've always dreamed of seeing my face reflected in your uh, fast approaching shiny helmet. Cut immediately to the rocket up to the, uh, the <laughs> rocket up to the um, freaking institute. Yeah. <laughs> so he tore me in half. <laughs> I found it was pl- fun. I found it who played the surprise character when I was watching it. It doesn't say in the credits. It says as himself. Yeah. But it, it was uh, facially mo cap by the director, uh-huh. and and okay. and um, and uh, the, the 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 physical like the, you know the the full performance capture the reference stuff and the voice were Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> and awesome. it makes sense when you realise that it is genuinely his favourite character from yeah. X Men. So it's like, oh, of course he couldn't resist. Well, and you know, it's 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 the best version of that character. Yeah, it's so good. That final fight between yeah. that character and Colossus and um, uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead and uh, it's Yukio, isn't it? But she's it's sharing the name of the isn't character sp- from from Wolverine stories, but is is based Blink? more on Blink. I think she's not like a she's like an amalgamation of Blink and Magic, kind of. Mm, okay, um, Magic's Welsh. Like how Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Is nothing like Negasonic Teenage Warhead in the books. Yeah, they've just gone. The name's cool, Brianna Hildebrand. Hildebrand. Yeah. Let's just create a new character, but give you that name. Okay. okay, okay. Same with Colossus. That's not what Colossus is like, but he can I, represent those. It those kind of is though. Well, he's so Boy Scouty. Yeah, but he also gets down and dirty. Listen, and then becomes the unstoppable Colossus. Listen. Which I'm, I'm, I know I'm, nothing about beyond the fact that he's in Contest of the Champions and I'm really confused by it. I've been reading a little bit of... Um, and then he grows a metal beard. Sorry. I've been reading a little <laughs> bit of early Claremont X-Men in which Colossus throws Wolverine up a castle wall. Yeah, he does. Because he calls Storm abroad too many times. Okay, that's Colossus. And that's where the fastball special is invented. That's what he's invented? I think so, yeah. Like, he does it to in, to have a go at him, and then yeah. later on it's like, Hey, it's, Bob, do that thing again that, that you did from the start. It's that story where they go they go to Sean Cassidy's family castle in Ireland. Oh, Jesus. And they have to save the leprechaun families from Black Tom Cassidy and the Juggernaut. Wait, the leprechaun families? Yes, the Wait, leprechaun families. Actual leprechauns? Yes, actual leprechauns. Who are, let me guess... Early mutants or something like uh, that. No, no, no. They're just leprechauns. They're just really small people who are Irish. Oh no, I feel really horrible. No, they should feel really horrible. They should. My God, they should. At least it's not the nineties X Men cartoon Irish characters, which are abysmal. No, but it's where that stuff comes from. I, um, I, I, you know, it's weird. It goes to show how much the X Men community as a whole have just kind of accepted the adaptations being wibbly or, or nonchalant with who it kills and who it keeps and things like that. Because it's been pulled into them. Even, think, even the ones that seem more faithful. Like, I've I've read pretty much all Deadpool up until about six years ago. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy the majority of it. Especially the Daniel Way stuff. I think it's great. Um, so when Black Tom Cassidy rocks up in Deadpool 2, I'm like, oh my god, Black Tom Cassidy! <laughs> That's cool. And that was the first giveaway to me that maybe the Juggernaut's going to be like mentioned. Mm. And then it's like, oh no! He, spoiler alert, he's in it. So it's yeah. like, that's kind of cool. But then Black Tom Cassidy's killed off. Yeah. And I was watching behind the scenes. He was meant to be the villain. <laughs> Black Tom was going to be the villain. And during production, uh, Juggernaut was always going to have a sequence. Yeah. But during production, they decided that they were just going to change it because the focus on um, Cable and 
and and Russell and everything just was working so much better than they kind of hoped that they decided no do you know what Black Tom Black Tom's more of an easter egg now like Black Tom is there so that actor I feel kind of bad for him because he prepped to be the main villain of the movie and then it was like actually we're changing it sorry we want the end to be about emotional stakes so the juggernaut works better because it's just a blank slate I, fists uh, character to face off against so strange I do hope he got paid for it that's all I'm saying Omega Red's in that movie yeah there's loads of there's loads there's so of cameos much, from like there's so much background fun loads of cameos from like Alpha Flight characters X-Force characters so many of them just hidden in the in the the prison scenes in the in the ice box, it's nuts. It's really weird. But you know what I mean. It, it says a lot that like because you, I, w- I would cast you as an X Men fan. Oh yeah. Um, you are very sort of at peace with the lack of decent representation of those characters within cinema. The, I I'm okay with the fact that we're these probably X-Men never going to get this. <laughs> are just not going to give me what I want from an X Men movie. I'm trying like to enjoy ever. them. No. De- Deadpool gives you like a sniff of it. Deadpool and Deadpool 2 is the closest it's got. Mostly because they show a love for the source yeah. material. Which, where, where there's the, most Which of the I, mainstream... I don't know if the X-Men and X-Men 2 have that love as well. Uh, but to it, a but, degree. But they were born in that era where superhero things were too frightened to look like superhero yeah. things. And and the, since then the movies have just sort of had an <clears> increasing <throat> embarrassment of the source material it feels like. Yeah. Um... So it's. I'm sure my cat's cuddling up to a Doc Ock toy for some reason. Oh, she's got a towel on that ass. Oh, damn. <laughs> she is cleaning herself. Um, <laughs> Please don't do it on Otto. No, no. He's she's, reformed now. She's. Uh, yeah, she's gone for it. Um, <laughs> that's what cats do. But yeah, I'm. I. Mm, I'm mm. I, I can't wait for the, the expert movies to just go away. Sooner, I'm not saying sooner want, rather than later. I'm not saying I want the MCU to bring them back because I'm not I'm not hot on the whole Marvel Fox merger. But uh, yeah, well, I'll put it this way: I, here's, here's here's some. I've become a little more at ease thinking about that stuff now because try as try as we might, <laughs> like we could make a difference. Yeah, but we're try not as we stop might, it. The monopoly's happening. Yeah, and that sucks for business, and that that is bullshit. I'm I'm just not I, I'm not sure as consumers what we can do to we can't stop it. And, and that's the thing we shouldn't we shouldn't try to affect the stuff that is inevitable mm. in an attempt because like us boy- if we suddenly boycotted an MCU X-Men movie that wouldn't solve well, I don't the think problem boycotts work all that would do society. is have a negative effect on a franchise we are enjoying yeah. <laughs> it's like we don't want to do that yeah. there's not really anything we can do that's the problem there's nothing we can do and that sucks balls doesn't mean it's right however put that to one side we can now look at that play that play box of well if these characters are going to get involved now what do we want to happen with that because yeah. that's you know that, the, the marvel fox thing is such a small part of the problem of the monopoly uh, yeah um so but anyway that being said uh yeah maybe the x-men will get a decent treatment in phase four phase five or whatever because that they'll, 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 shock they'll, treatment. they'll definitely be like the, the the next sort of now what's our next focus yeah this story yeah and, so. and that could hopefully be really good. But... Who would you cast as Wolverine? I wouldn't. Fair enough. Not at first. Yeah, fair enough. Because it's been... It's it, it's one of those things, how do you, For better or worse... <clears throat> um, The old huge Ackman... <laughs> is so... <laughs> he's so iconic in that role. He is a huge Ackman. And That's he's been thing. both good and bad in it. Where, like, where they've been able to avoid it... Uh, the MCU has, has avoided using iconic characters that had an iconic performance in a movie as yet. Yeah. For example, Spider-Man, it looks like there are no designs to bring in his big rogues yet. No. Because... Osborne's Duf- not even mentioned, Duf- Duf- No. Defoe had such a distinct performance. And of course you can forget Chris Cooper's amazing oh. portrayal. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Defoe and, Defoe and Melina specifically, like their performances were so solid, they're not even yeah. attempting. Yeah, I... J.K. Simmons is Jameson. They're not even attempting to do it. No. And it's something that I respect them for doing that. I want them to do it, but take your time. Yeah. Because that's fine. Get it so that people are like, oh, these two, three Spider-Man things have been fun. I wonder what their version of that would be like because yeah. then there's an interest in it. Um, and same with uh, same with X-Men. Like you say, you could reboot X-Men quite happily for me, but there's a few things where people I think will have a problem in readjusting. Uh, 
Magneto and Presser X less so because they did it once already and we were fine with it. Yeah. Because the, the, the results for First Class were really good. So it was like, fair enough. Um, and then that spiritual acknowledging of, yes, you guys are definitely as good as us by Days of Future Past being a thing. <laughs> um, but Wolverine is one where... Hmm. That being said, how tall is Luke Evans? Because no if, if he's like five six, I, I don't think we're gonna get I a would short cast Wolverine. The, I would cast. I'd cast. I'd have five six Wolverine. There's no such thing as a short Wolverine. There's no such thing as a, what? No, there's no such thing as a short movie star. There's definitely such a thing as a short Wolverine, but there's no such thing as a short movie star. If Tom Cruise wasn't so creepy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Paddy Considine. That's not a bad shout, actually. He'd be a pretty good Wolverine. Like, go full-blown Canadian and gruff yeah. little sort of arsehole, but he's, he's, he has that on-screen charm, and he has that element about him as an actor, mm. but he can also really character it and can hide behind the grubby, scary character that Wolverine can and should be, mm. um, if you're doing a more straight adaptation. Yes. Yes, I would um, do it. <laughs> I would, I would, I'd just do the 5 OGX, man. Yeah! <gasps> oh, God, that'd be the best one, wouldn't it? Pre-Blue Furry Beast. Yeah. Just, you know. Yes. Oh, old, God, Big yes. old lumbery beast. Someone, uh... Angel. Finally give Angel the opportunity to be cool. Angel. I don't know, he's pretty cool in Bohemian Rhapsody. Is he Brian May? Ben Ro- Hardy. Roger Taylor. Who plays Angel in Apocalypse. He's, yeah. He's Roger Taylor in Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh. Um, what an interesting topic. Maybe we should, we should get we'll, on we'll, we'll touch your sentence. In a moment. Um, <laughs> you want someone big and burly, like a like a big like college football playing looking motherfucker for... For the beast, yeah. If you're going for young beast, go the route first class did and cast like a charming younger actor like Nicholas Holt for that. The only problem, but, but aim for somebody who is a bit of a brick shit out. The only problem well. with doing the five O G X men is you haven't got enough women on the team. So maybe I'd bring in something like St- someone, something, someone like Storm or um, Ooh, yeah onto the team. <gasps> All right, tinker it slightly. Older beast, not old old beast, but like. Comparatively okay, okay. old beast. So like, right. So this beast, is this is beast is a college graduate. We begin with Xavier. We begin with Xavier's second class, as it were. Okay. He's already had like he's already been doing this for but a bit, he, and now the Wolverine. and now the institute is starting to build. No, but you make it so that this class is Gene Scott. Bobby, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's Angel's name again? Uh, Warren. Warren. Uh, Warren and Aurora. Let's say. Yeah. Aurora. 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 Um, so, so you know, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, Marvel Girl, um, Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Cyclops, Ice Iceman, Man, Angel, Angel and, Storm. and Storm. Hank was part of the previous class and is the one who was stuck around, yeah, to help oversee it. So he is in a tutory role, but he's not Xavier's age. Banshee should be an older one. He should be. A Banshee should be an older one. And four of the originals should have left. Because they joined someone else. So you have the original class comprising of whoever is currently the Brotherhood of Mutants. Which, if you want to go Which classic. means there is already... A, there's a personal thing with Charles yeah. for everyone. It's not just Charles' old best mate sicking them, sicking them on people. And if you want to go classic, that would be... What? Mastermind, Toad, Mastermind, Toad, Scarlet Witch, and Quicksilver. Sc- well, you can't but do you that. You could do that MCU. But you could do Mastermind, um, Pyro... Polaris? Avalanche. Is Polaris the green one? Polaris. Um, Polaris and Havoc were introduced into the original X-Men series before the all-new all-different stuff. Yeah. Like right. towards the end of the run. As X-Men. Yeah. So, so you could, you could, you could do Polaris and Havoc, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's how you do it. Yeah. And, and you keep you save Magneto for film two. You could have the Brotherhood in film one, but you save Magneto for film oh, two. Oh, don't do Mystique either. Don't do Mystique. Don't touch Mystique. Mystique can be... a don't po- Mystique, Mystique can be Mystique can be a post credit sting. Yeah. To imply the next story. And save Magneto. The same way that if they do Fantastic Four, you should save Doom. Yes. Save Doom for the second film. Yes. Or if you know that your first one... If your first um, one made all the money in the world and you know your second one's going to make all the money in the world, you save Doom for three. Yeah. You make him the finale of a trilogy. Or a quadrilogy. There should be four Fantastic Four movies. Um, Yes. Yeah. Who'd you cast as Professor X? Because that's tough. Fuck. Go American. I, I suggest go American. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because Charles, um, Charles wasn't... 
Charles was never British in the comics, was he? The sort of implications later that he is because of like Patrick Stewart. Yeah, he's American in the. I think they've talked about the how he's, he's he studied at Oxford or whatever. So there's like, but that doesn't mean he's English. No. Um, so go American. Um, fuck. Mm. Um, and again, you don't want to make you don't want to make him too old old and world weary you want him to be somebody who is still getting the ropes of this that's why the second class is his attempt at, at doing it right like um, he didn't get it right the first time fucking hell uh, that's so a really good one so you want someone in maybe their late 40s early 50s in the role late 40s early 50s American actor with gravitas mm. and presence <clears throat> Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> 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 meat, 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 meat. I don't know. Singing meat. I'm I really, I honestly meat. don't know. I can't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm at a loss for who I would cast. That's quite tough, actually. I'm trying. I'm sort of is looking at action thing? figures on the it's walls in a vain attempt to give myself a clue. Like, oh, who's this person? That doesn't help at all. <laughs> um, yeah, like I don't fucking know. Um. I, that, is, that is actually quite it's really hard, Xavier's isn't it? tough. All right, Magneto. Because maybe if we get Magneto, we'd have a better grasp on Charles. Um, and this would mean as well, this would place their relationship, their time as friends in, say, like the 90s. It's like late 90s, early 2000s. And that's when the split, that's when the divide has happened for them. Uh, so that in the late 2010s slash early 2020s is where they're at this stage in their life. It's like if they're mm. if they're if they're in their late forties, early fifties, that means that it was mm. it was in their late twenties, mm. early thirties that they were at loggerheads. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Again, kind of tough, isn't it? <laughs> Recontextualize Magneto's origin. Yes. Oh from, yeah, you have to bring him forward from Holocaust yeah. Germany yeah. to apartheid South America, uh, South Africa. Yeah. Um, Shit. Do you know what? I think we touched on this a while ago. Yeah, go yeah, for yeah. yeah. Go for this. Go for this. Go for this. Um, I don't know who to cast, but I think that's where you should. Yeah. Where you should center it. Um. Yeah, because we touched on this briefly before. We said instead of focusing on mutant kind as sort of a uh, a representation of marginalized, uh, mostly sort of like like LGBTQ, for example. Yeah. Make it more about racial divide. I mean. And play on that. Absolutely, do keep the LGBTQ. Yeah, up. no, sure, but but at the but same time, make it a more intersectional. Thing yeah, of like every... like at least with Charles and Eric's story. Yeah, make it more about um, sort of the idea of like racial divide and and, and how that should be handled. Um, but more metaphorical this time. Like for example, in Black Panther, Killmonger handled that stuff a lot more on the surface level. Mm. This is where you can read. You can do the fantasy sci-fi thing of using a fantasy sci-fi prism to tell those stories. Yes. Um, but at the same time, like with the kids, with the kids, you can make it more about the idea of being yourself and not being restricted and and feeling judged. Yes. But with Eric and Eric and Charles's split specifically, you can go back to that side of stuff. Um, oh, still in K. Brown was already in Black Panther. Yeah. Well, yes, as to Char- as young T'Chaka, but he, wasn't he? But be, briefly, he'd be a pretty great Xavier. But briefly, keep in mind, yeah. Laura, what's her face? played like three different roles she was um in avengers as the waitress she was in guardians as um star lord's mum no the waitress is um ashley some um ashley johnson is it yeah oh that's right what's the face from guardians is in like a scene in that she's in like the foreground laura haddock laura haddock she's in like a scene in that as someone yeah um um and she's played she played someone else in the MCU no, as well. Just played, I think she's just who played, in the MCU um, has double dipped. A few people have double dipped. Some some people have double dipped. Yeah, but I think they've only double dipped from TV into yeah. like as um. It's... Oh, what was her name? She played Mariah Dillard in, in Luke Cage, but she's uh, oh uh, uh, Alfred Woodard. Woodard. Yeah, uh, she's Alfred in Woodard. she's in Civil War and is Mariah in Luke Cage. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, uh, still in K Brown would be really still in K Brown would be good Xavier. Um, It'd be a good Magneto. Who would be a good Magneto? Uh, fuck. I mean, I if don't you don't know. if you don't mind going a little bit older with the ages, 
fucking Keith David would be a really interesting Magneto. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. you just, something about that energy and the presence you of him. You can be quite sinister, can't you? You can. Um, he can play scary, but he's also very he's also very self-aware. So I think he would fit into a comic book movie that is openly a comic book movie quite happily. Yes. Like, he'd be able to find that balance. Um. Yeah, I can see that. Damn, I want to watch this movie. <laughs> I want to see this uh, film. Oh, pardon me. Yeah. Well, um, so speaking, yes, anyway. Speaking of films... Films and things we've seen. Fucking hell! Tell you right. what, tell you what I saw the other day. What? Nothing, because annoyingly, um, I wasn't doing too well, and Lou was feeling pretty sleepy, so well, we backed off a cinema date. But then I can we went on another cinema date. Do you know what we saw? Nothing. Nothing, because we were in town, and Lou just sort of turned to me and was like, "Do you want to just mooch and maybe do some?" Just some retail therapy for a bit. I've not done this in forever. It was like, okay, those, we ended up not buying anything for ourselves. We got some Christmas gifts, and then we went that, home. Those words that everyone longs to hear from from their uh, from their partner. Should we just not? <laughs> but then I hear it all the time. Like a, <laughs> I don't. Like um, a bolt out of the blue, or the sound of a balloon popping. <laughs> ah, that wasn't very loud. That's, uh, damn it! Hang on. Or like the sound of a balloon popping. That it's not popping. Give me, give me the needle. Give me the needle. That's how you do it. There we go. Matthew went and saw a movie. Yeah. That metaphor didn't work. I went to see Bohemian Rhapsody on Sunday. The, the Sunday just gone. The, the Freddie Mercury slash Queen biopic. That was directed in scare quotes by Brian Singer. Directed in, in by, directed and subsequently abandoned mid-production by Brian Singer. And then finished by Dexter Fletcher. Here's a tiny bottled history of the production of this movie. About a decade or more ago, yeah. a movie was in production about the life of Freddie Mercury and specifically about the final years of his life. With? Sasha Baron Cohen starring and also involved in the scripting and executive producing roles. Queen were working alongside them. And Did it have a director at that point? I don't know if it had a definitive director at any point. It definitely had people sign on and then leave before pre-production or in pre-production there was an error and then things stalled it and stuff like that. So I don't think it ever had like a consistent, this will be the director. Yeah. But... It changed over quite a lot. It was going to be a bit more light-hearted. Then it was going to be a straight biopic. Some people thought because of Sasha Baron Cohen's casting, it was going to be a comedy. Um, he confirmed afterwards that comedic elements were in there. Yeah, but it was a biopic about Freddie Mercury. It was not a, you know, it was it wasn't a comedy movie. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen eventually left the project about three years ago. I think it was three or more years ago, mm. and when interviewed on. Howard Stern's podcast about it he said like you you were following this like for years you were involved in this for years yeah, why yeah. would you suddenly leave it and 2013 he said, it was that Cohen stepped away yeah so he, he said um, without naming names uh, influences over the movie wanted a very different story than the one they were going to tell um, specifically in regards to how Queen were represented and he went on to describe that somebody uh, wanted the movie to be about Freddie's passing and then how the band, you know, in his spirit, yeah. continued to go on playing strength to strength. And if you know Queen, like myself and Matt, and you're a fan of Queen... Personal friends. Oh, yeah, we, oh we're like, we're like, we're like... Me and me and we're like, we're like, we're like, we're like that. Uh, me and uh, John Deacon, best of buds. Yeah. Is that why he's so quiet? Yeah. Because <laughs> you keep him in your bass, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, come on, so... play the bass line, John. Come on, play the basement, John. Play the bass, play the bass in the basement, John. Um, <laughs> it, it's, but as fans of Queen, we can say this. Queen ended with um, innuendo and, and technically with... Uh, Made in Heaven. With Made in Heaven. Yeah which was the album released posthumously for Freddie Mercury of material they'd been working on and bits and pieces and also some songs. Stuff he'd recorded. Some songs that, that were finished, primarily yeah. by Brian and Roger because, yeah. of course, if you, you know you listen to any Queen album, like two or three of the songs are always sung by or, or led by Brian or Roger because yeah. that was how the songwriting process worked. And they were all... They were all singers. Yeah. And freaking gorgeous stuff. Like, I'm in love with my car from one of the earlier albums. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. But it's, it's just a really sort of simple, like, what? 
that become that there's a running gag about I'm in, love with the, I'm in love with my car in the movie weird I, see I've got a lot of love for that song because it's just sort of this really simple idea no one else did well, <laughs> yeah, I like it um, but if, I was going to say like that's Rogers later on Brian made a song called Driven By You there's a bit of a theme here yeah. um, but Cars. you know so, so but the Queen as it was ended with sort of the sign off was the Freddie Mercury tribute concert in like 94, 95 like, yeah. that was the sign off yeah that was the like and we're done They've and they've they've, and they've, they've, yeah. they've been around and stuff and they tour they've tour they, they do something that's kind of brilliant people get to still enjoy their music because they tour with different vocalists yeah and sometimes they make albums with those guest vocalists yeah they of, made, a, of new they stuff made an album covers. with Paul Rogers didn't they Paul Rogers yeah from Free yeah um, and he was the first big name uh, they dabbled they teamed up briefly with Five when Five did a cover of a Queen song oh, everyone's fucking covered We Will Rock You yeah but like when Five did it like Brian and Roger got involved yeah, didn't yeah. it was like fair enough and, and you know the idea being that they're like hey if you want to do some of our stuff we'll do it with you why not like this is cool Adam Lambert's their current vocalist and they're doing really well with him I think they've been touring yeah. with him for like three plus years yeah, now yeah. Um, I keep saying that I want to see Robbie Williams team up with them I because, always thought that was a, that would be a good match because he's got that showmanship yeah like he's got that showmanship and it would be interesting to see uh, John Deacon the bassist retired after they finished Made in Heaven and did the Freddie Tribute concert yeah so he's not been involved um, since then and all that's really known is that he just sort of was like it's kind of like without Freddie what we were kind of isn't there yeah. anymore and I, I think now's the time for me to call it a day and that's you know that's fine and he still is he's sort of like the silent partner of it all in that he yeah. handles business he's stuff very, he's very private yeah and you know power to him fair enough Brian and Roger carry on it's heavily implied by Sasha's story and other things that Brian and Roger are the ones who warped the story a little bit and yeah. really got involved when the movie was fast tracked about two years ago into production. Well, I've got, I've got as a what is of, now Bohemian Rhapsody. I've got a little bit of info about like past production um, trouble. So it was during it was in, started in development with Sasha Brown Cohen attached in the early 2010s. Yeah, but I mean, he'd, he'd been chatting away on it for yeah. ages. Yeah, he bowed out in 2013 because of creative differences with Brian May and Roger Taylor. Um. It was also a thing about tone, like Brown, Sash Brown Cohen wanted to make it a bit more adult oriented, whereas the. Yeah, which is, is whereas, the only way you can really yeah. tell that story. Whereas Brian May Roger Taylor wanted to make it a bit more family friendly. Um, There's a way to do that. You make two movies. You make your biopic, and then you make a, a jukebox film yeah. using Queen as a framework, yeah. but you don't do We Will Rock You. Um, um, so, they, yeah. They, which is. Uh, yeah. But they, apparently, they were also concerned about him being too well known as a comedian and a prankster. Um, Ben Whishaw actually was set to replace him. I could see, I could see Ben Whishaw playing younger Freddy, but he had some problems with the script. Okay, which having seen the film is probably this probably, version. Is probably yeah. the, those those problems were probably borne out into production. Um, oh, David yeah. Fincher was attached to direct at one point, and then Dexter Fletcher was attached as director mm-hmm. in 2013. Right. Okay. But then he stepped back from it a couple of months after because apparently he was having creative differences with Graham King who was one of the co-producers yes uh, but then of course Fletcher eventually came on to finish the film as Bra- after Brian Singer famously after, after, after X-Men director yeah, Brian Singer famously bringing was, it all back together guys if you're wondering why we're talking about a music film in our pop culture podcast yeah he, he, <laughs> they fired him basically he he was Absentee. He was he was an absentee director. Yeah. Uh, Tom Hollander quit uh, the film, and Rami Malek complained to Fox Studio heads. Sim and Rami Malek came to you know. Work, Tom Hollander's like... still in it though, right? Oh yeah, he came back. Right. Okay. He came back. Yeah. Um. Uh. When when Fox stepped in and started sorting stuff out. Okay. Uh, after the Thanksgiving break, apparently he just didn't show up to set for ten days. Brian Singer. Yeah. Oh Christ. Ten days straight, and then Fox just went right. Fuck you. You're off it. So they brought in Dexter Fletcher, Fletcher to finish it. Now, because Brian Singer directed a certain portion and stuff to do with the director skills of America, yeah. he's, he's credited, credited as director. director, but Dexter Fletcher has top exec producer credit. But make no mistake! <laughs> I mean, Dexter Fletcher's been attached to the project for a long time, but yeah. make no mistake, <laughs> this film is definitely a product of a troubled production <laughs> because I'm here to tell you Dear listener. He's got that gorgeous shit-eating grin on his face, boys and girls. Here we go. Bohemian Rhapsody (laughs) is a fucking mess. (laughs) 
You're just it, you're just saying what the I, critics are saying. You're just saying the popular I, reaction. I know it's going down well with audiences, and um, we've we've proved. I don't say we proved, but we've witnessed uh, <laughs> time and time again the audiences are fucking stupid. We enjoyed Venom. It is not a it's good not movie. It's not good. Like it is possible to enjoy something and acknowledge full well that it is a mess. But I didn't really enjoy Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm. I liked some of it, and it's frustrating because when it's good, yeah, it's really very good. Yeah, but when it's bad, it's just really fucking dull. They made a movie about Queen, about Queen, and it's dull. That takes fucking effort. They had to work to make this movie as dull as it is. Could, I mean, you, could you give us the basic, the sort of back right. of the DVD box summary? Um, what is Bohemian Rhapsody about? Spoilers going forward, ladies and gentlemen. Spoilers, spoilers. Be aware of spoilers. So young... Because um, it's not spoilers. These things are based on real events, unquote. Young Farouk Pulsara um, becomes the front man of a local band in London. Do they use his original name in the film? Uh, uh, in his, I think in the very early scenes... His parents call him Farouk, and then he tells him it's Freddy. Right, it's Freddy okay. now, and they're like, "Why are you changing your name? Why are you changing your name?" Um, okay, fair enough. And then so late, they at least acknowledge his upbringing a bit. And then later on, he reveals to his parents uh, over um, that he's legally changed his name to Freddie Mercury. Okay, and they're a bit upset. Um, there's a whole thing. There's a whole thing with his parents in this, which we'll get to. Um, <laughs> he, he so auditions to be part of a band, or like applies to be part of a band. <sighs> He goes to watch him, and then they're single leaves, and then he talks to him in the parking lot, and he does a little bit of singing, and they're like, okay, you're on. And then he plays with them, and then they go and make an album, and then they become huge, and then they make another album, and they do Bohemian Rhapsody, and da, 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 da. and they get big, but he's got demons, and he's getting too, he's getting, he's partying too hard, and people, then people are worried about they're going to break up the band, and what's going to happen? But then, it, and it's all the tumult, the tumult of the careers of Queen leading up to their triumphant uh, 1985 Live Aid performance. Um, this is allegedly a movie based on a true story, but boy, have they taken some fucking liberties with the facts to squeeze a story out of this. I mean, we've talked before about how biopics kind of tend to follow a certain structure because of the nature of real life and, and narratives and stuff. Yeah, like, and you have to you kind of you have to squeeze things around. Compartmentalize and stuff. to make it into a narrative that fits an hour forty-five. I motion picture for example I think some of this some of the changes they've made in this border on like defamation of character wow. which without <laughs> without knowing for sure what happened there's definitely it, feel, it feels like there's an effort to sort of from the surviving members of Queen to sort of own the narrative of what happened um, and I'll tell you for how and I'll tell you for why <laughs> but first again I just want to warn you about spoilers Actually, before we get into that, before we get into proper spoilers, the good. The good about this film. Okay. Rami Malek is going full tilt for this shit. Yeah. Absolutely full tilt. And he is magnetic in it. Unfortunately, they don't really give him anything interesting to do. Oh. So, okay. Uh, there is that. Um, and the, the dental prosthesis he's wearing is really distracting. Like, he doesn't need it. Or he doesn't need it to be as prominent as it is. Um... The rest of the pe- of the of the guys playing the bands are Gwilym Lee as Brian May, Ben Hardy as Roger Taylor, and Joseph Mazzello as John Deacon. Fucking brilliant. Like some of the best bits in the film are those four just dicking around and being a band and yeah. being friends. Like that's hands down the best stuff in the film. Okay. So the bits where they're being yeah. people and yeah. not are not being When they come together and write the songs. And they could, and and the film sort of contrives the. This is the moment where they heard this riff for the first time. Mark Hermo calls it. A, he has a name for it. He calls it the chubby mm-hmm moment, and it's from an old music biopic. I think it's the Buddy Ho- Buddy Holly story, where there's a conversation with Chubby Checker and some other musicians, and they they stumble upon the so- the title for uh, one of his songs, and Chubby and Chubby Checker just does a. Hmm. Absolutely. When he hears it, and then yeah. it's like, so it's that moment in in a biopic where <laughs> you see the, where you see it, they, they, the, the moment that they works if it's egg on hey, so heavily. Chuck, it's your cousin Marvin. Marvin, very uh, yeah. You know the new sound you're looking for. We'll listen to this, yeah. which works in a freaking fantasy comedy yeah, time they, travel movie. Yeah, because, because it's sort of like, oh, that's kind of funny. Like this movie's claiming Chuck Berry came up with that song because he heard it over the phone. This film is 
chock full of those oh, fucking moments. God. And they just get... And there's a definite rhythm to the first part of the film where it's like, they come up with an idea, they record the idea, they release the song, and right. then there's a montage of them playing it. And I say playing it, this film is like the longest, biggest budget episode of Lip Sync Battle you will ever see. Thanks, I hate it. Thanks, I oh, hate God. it. Which is weird because Rami Malek and others have talked about how they've been in the studio. Yeah. They've done mixes. And, uh, there's there's a, a sound alike from one of the, the big tribute bands yeah, who, yeah. who was brought in as well to help like mix the voices so that Rami's vocals sort of blended with Freddie's and Freddie, um, Freddie's lower in the mix. And apparently so that, they're... You know, yeah, but it just doesn't feel like that. It just feels like... Well, I think there's probably, feels, probably stuff for the soundtrack album more it than feels anything. Like or, or for when they're in the studio bits, maybe. It feels like mimicry in that it's a technical accomplishment and very impressively, a, a very impressive technical accomplishment, but it doesn't make me feel anything. Yeah. This film, yeah. famously now, is because all of you mentioned this, it recreates in its entirety the 20 minute Live Aid set, which is the, sort of the climax of the film. And I, all I thought throughout the entire what should have I should have been watching it going wow wow these this band was fucking great and all I was thinking was this could, is this is going on so long I could go to HMV right now yeah. pick up pick up a DVD they, of yeah. Live Aid and watch they, this they, <laughs> I, 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 they start it and I'm like are they going to do the whole thing are they going to yeah, they're gonna. Does it have intercut do moments thing. where it's like cuts to someone backstage like I've got to go talk to him or some shit no, it's, like that? It's, or... it, it, <laughs> because they also they also play fast and loose with a very big <laughs> part of the final years of his life. We'll get to that. Yeah, it which cut, affects the live. Age it cross cuts to um, <laughs> Mary Austin and Jim Hutton and Mary Austin's husband watching from backstage. Right. It cuts to his family watching on TV. Right, um, and it cuts to Bob Geldof watching from the offices as the phone starts to ring and everyone starts donating money. That's kind of funny, I guess. <laughs> the guy that gets played Bob Geldof is fucking incredible, like straight up. Um, That's kind of funny, I suppose. It's, I mean, it just it just doesn't make. Me but that's feel weird because it's also like Queen single handedly raised all the money. It's like what. They get into Hammer to Fall, which is my favourite Queen song. Fucking great song. It's the third song they play at the, the Live Aid. Gorgeous opening no. riff. And then Freddie's just fucking going for it. And I'm watching it going. And they're just going to do this whole fucking thing. <laughs> That's your favourite song. You're going. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the. It just. It, You're it, sat there just like. A little piece of me is falling it, away. It's a, it's a movie about. I'm Get some popcorn. Oh, fucking hell! <laughs> it's a movie about a, 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 a quad, a, a quartet of musical geniuses mm. who created some of the most iconic, enduring rock music and even pop music of the 20th century. They and hybridize and mash up operetto yeah. and and like. Yeah. Their music was exciting, and Freddie Mercury was famously flamboyant and hedonistic, and um, like off just sta- off stage, as fascinating as he was on, like one of the, one of the greatest front men of all music. Like. And it's just boring. <laughs> it's boring, <laughs> and I don't know how they managed it oh, because God. there's so much of this that should work, and it just fucking doesn't. <laughs> Right, so let's let's get into some serious spoilers. I'm going to spoil the shit out of this. Not that you can really spoil that much of it, because, okay, a lot of this really happened. A lot of this is also made up and moved around. So, all right, what do you want to know? What do you want to know? Um, <laughs> fucking, so they make... Uh, so is he not in a band when he first meets them? No. Okay, that's weird. Because what I mean, actually I get it. happened yeah. was that they... <laughs> in real life... Freddie was uh, university friends with, or college friends with, the singer of Brian May and Roddy Taylor's band, Smile. Mm. Yeah. And he was in another band. And when their singer left, they got Freddie in as a replacement because yeah. they already knew. Because they, 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 they were yeah. still they were still called Smile. They, they, they were friends. They? Yeah. No, like they, and they were you know contemporaries. In the, I think my dad the said that he saw room. them support for someone while they were still called Smile. Wow. Yeah, like because yeah. I think they were called. I think they kept the name like briefly, didn't they? Like, yeah, for a bit. Yeah, yeah. And then they see, were like, "Let's rework." You see, it. in this, what's supposed to be his first performance with Smile, um, <laughs> uh, 
but in this he's just he goes to see Smile yeah. on the night that their singer coincidentally leaves and he corners him in the parking oh, lot God. and he's like I write songs and then he does a bit of singing for him and they're like alright yeah we'll have him <sighs> um, wow. so already that's kind of doing the thing of them going yeah, we are blessing you yeah. with the in, the entry into our world yeah. and that will unlock the power yeah to, to, okay that's and um, mm, but he also at this mm. show he also meets Mary Austin for the first time who would later go on to be his wife yeah and they're a couple for a long time there is some like early hinting before it gets explicit later on of, of his uh, bisexuality yeah, yeah. um but they do get you know they get married in their very and you, you get the, you get the moment where he writes the love of my life about her mm. and but then you also that moment is also when Paul Prentice right. first kisses him right like they're both in the but you've seen Paul's been in this because yeah they sign up again that's, that's brought hell around. forward isn't it when they fucking when they fucking around with this, they, <clears> they <throat> make it out that they immediately sign with John Reed. Which didn't happen at no, first. No, not happen. But they immediately signed with John Reed and Paul Prentice is, a, is his right-hand man. Okay. And then they're recording a night at the opera in mm. this farmhouse and it's like 2am in the morning and Paul and Freddie are sitting in the studio and Freddie's playing Love of My Life and Paul's like, oh, it's pretty. And then he comes over and's kissing him and Freddie's like, no, no, no. <laughs> but the, the release, that's the first hint you've got the film at that point the, yeah. the one that Paul's even gay much right. less that he's interested in Freddie much less that, much less that these two have any relationship yeah uh, leading up to that mean. point yeah like to the to the point where Paul would feel comfortable enough to get up that close to him and just snog him yeah like, without any hesitation um and it's because it basically skips from they record their first album it makes it look like they record of the whole of Queen in a night then they get signed they sign to John Reed they make a bunch of money they tour America all, obviously all through all this they're making other albums yeah. then they they um, go for a meeting with this fictional record exec who's played by Mike Myers in heavy makeup um, to get a budget for what would be Cub Night at the Opera right. and then they go off and record Night at the Opera Okay. and then they bring in Bohemian Rhapsody and he's like, six minutes and they'll play it. So they walk out of his, of that label. Yeah. And Jim Beach. This is... And John Reed and Paul Prentice go with them. Right. Okay. Um, Tom Holland is Jim Beach. Aiden yeah. Gillen is Jim, is Tom, Jim Tom Reed. Holland. Tom Hollander, sorry. So I was, I was like, hang on, that's a bloody, that's a bloody well, young, that's a bloody young version um, of him. Unless you're referring to the 80s director. No, not that. Tom <laughs> um, they fuck off. They go get another deal. For, um, Kenny Everett plays Bohemian Rhapsody. It goes huge. It gets massive. Um, but yeah, Kenny Everett. Do they touch on the fact that he famously played it like eighty odd times in a row in his show? Got loads, nope. of, loads of complaints from his management, but the no, listeners thought it was the do, coolest thing ever. They do linger on Mary Austin noticing how close him and Freddie seem to be, even though she didn't know that he knew him. He, what? Huh? Okay. Okay. Um, and then, okay. so instead of touching on, because there is a, there is a story about like their friendship and everything, their relationship, and what may have may not have gone on between them in the late eighties, um, in terms of like what role they played in each other's lives. Well, not here. There isn't. But I was going to say this is this is way before that yeah. like sort of part of their like, life. The, the, the one there's, there's, in... there's, there's a documentary called uh, I think it's like um, when Kenny met Freddie or something, which is yeah. about like th- their time. In the late 80s, because um, unfortunately the two of them passed away from a very similar disease. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, and, and there are several other rockers but, and musicians around that time where there was, sus- you know, suspect of were they all involved. We're going to get to that, Chris. But, we're going to get to that. But the more interesting part of Kenny's story in relation to Queen at this part of their history is that infamous day where he played Bohemian Rhapsody a million times, mm. which is would be a great, like, hilarious bit of summer because that should be something people come away from this movie going... That didn't happen. People going, oh yeah, no, that really happened. Basically, what they do in this is that he, they they walk out of the label and they take it to Kenny Everett because they he because they know that he's the only person who will play it 
Right. So they give That's him the pivotal moment. But they moment. don't. They're okay. just like, oh, we'll just take it straight to the radio stations. And then it cuts to Kenny Everett in the studio with Freddie, and they've got champagne, and they're laughing, and, uh, and they're very chummy and chummy and chummy, and he puts it on. Yeah. Um, and then Bohemian Rhapsody becomes a huge hit, and. Um, um, it's weird that, I've just realised it's weird that the film's called Bohemian Rhapsody yeah it is because um, is the story remotely a Bohemian Rhapsody no um, so it's just named after a song that it plays a part in the start of it's Act 2 it's named after a song that everyone knows it's named um, after a song everyone knows that appears in the start of Act 2 of the movie Freddie goes off on the tour and then he starts, to, starts becoming a bit more distant from Mary Austin and it's becoming clear that he's starting to sleep with men um, there's like one moment he, 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 but he's still kind of in denial about it and then when he comes home and he comes out to her and she gets all upset and, because of course she would um, but they're like oh no but we'll still be you know the best of friends and I still love you and all that stuff and then he moves into his own place and it's like this grand mansion and they're separated and he's got rooms for all the cats and then Mary Austin moves in next door and he calls her late at night uh, so they'll have a drink together over the phone and they're switching on lights to each other in the, across the windows but he's getting more and more hedonistic and and Paul uh, Paul Prentice is pushing him to to go party harder and harder and harder and and then any any motive shown he, as to why or well Paul Prentice manoeuvres John Reed to get fired by Freddie for suggesting to Freddie that he does a two album solo deal right with Capital that sounds about right or something like yeah that. um so Paul pushes John into suggesting it. Freddie goes mad at John and kicks him out of the car and Paul's like I had no idea I I, 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 I did I told him not to tell you I told him not to talk about it um, oh, and then so. they make so they, they make they basically turn Paul Prentice into uh, the movie's villain but yeah basically because a biopic turn, needs a villain and they basically turn it into Paul Prentice leeching off Freddie's increasing hedonism and just feeding him drugs and parties and stuff and Freddie walking away from Queen to do these two solo albums that turn out terribly and then Mary Austin finally persuades Freddie to turn his back on Paul and he comes back to Queen hat in hand and says oh we've got to do this live aid what? thing what yep that's um, not what happened. we've got to do this live aid thing they parted uh, for like seven months to work on some other stuff and then yeah. they got back together they doesn't, did the work doesn't mention Roger Taylor's two solo albums or Brian May's collaboration album with the dude from Yes yeah um, or any of that uh doesn't mention the fact that jo- Roger Taylor had done some albums before Freddie even thought about going off it. Doesn't mention the works, you know, the album, the works that Hammer to yeah. Fall is on that they yeah. toured before. Right up Live until Aid. like what, got... like eight weeks before Live Aid, yeah. they, they were touring. They've got this scene where he he calls Jim Beach and they all get called in together. And it, the last time the boys saw each other was very acrimonious. And oh, we haven't played together for so long. Are we going to be able to do it? Uh, Let me guess. They get back together like a day before Live Aid, and then that's the oh, they've still got it. Uh, it's like oh, even no, though Live no. Aid would have been organised well in it's advance. Like, it's like a week before Live Aid. Piss off. No, no, it's no, no. That's they, so they, they organise it, but it's like, but it's after the tickets have already been sold. Oh Christ! So, but they get squeezed onto the bill. Jim Beach gets them in. Oh, they get squeezed um, onto the they bill. Get squeezed onto they? the bill. Um, and. Right. <laughs> And, and then there's a rehearsal thing where uh, they're, at, they're at rehearsal and Freddie can't hit all the notes and his voice is, is all knackered because he'd been partying so hard and everyone's like oh it'll be fine it'll be fine you'll get it and then and then he turns around and tells everyone that he's been diagnosed with HIV tells the band do we see that? yes you see him go for an examination and there's a moment which is supposed to be poignant oh when he now goes, this is this is already oh, weird oh go on get this yeah. When he goes his, the morning where he wakes up and he and he goes and he gets dressed and he's having breakfast and he goes to the examination and he see him get the news and then he's walking out of the doctor's surgery. It's underscored by who wants to live forever. Oh fuck off! <laughs> I shit you not. That's dreadful. That yes, is in really it bad is, taste. It's dreadful. I think it's a, I think it's a vocal, isolated vocal track of it, but yeah, it's that. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. You could totally play on that song and his notion of like sort of coming to terms with his illness later on in his personal sort yeah, of but we recollection don't, of it. We because don't that was part that. of that song and everything is the part of the spirit of that is like. But we don't like, like to see any of that. But also, because... he wasn't diagnosed till like two years after Live Aid. Nineteen eighty-seven. Yeah. Um. 
So anyway, he tells why all the... Why is Live Aid the finale? He tells I all the band that he's, got, that he's got HIV. Like, why then, is that the... This is the finale. And then they end up... Is that because they're at their peak, basically? Oh, is that why it's the wait, finale? But wait till oh. it gets to the actual day of Live Aid. Christ. So when, back when he was partying hard, he, yeah. met, he met someone who was like a waiter at one of his parties and he ended up... And he... And he and then had ended up having a drink with him, and that's Jim Hutton. Right. And Jim's like, I like you a lot for a day. Come find me when you like yourself. And then he walks out, and Freddie doesn't see him again. And there's like a scene where Fr- Freddie's looking up Jim Hutton in the phone book, and there's like an entire page of Jim Hutton's. Um, on the day of Live Aid, on the day of Live Aid, yeah. Freddie wakes up, he gets in his car, and he goes and finds Jim Hutton. And he says, Come with me, Jim. I want you to meet my family. And then he takes Jim Hutton to see his family for tea. Sorry, for sorry. afternoon tea, and comes out to his family with Jim, and finally gets some approval and acceptance off his dad, and then he goes to play Live Aid. Oh god! <laughs> and then, and then Mary, Mary, Mary Austin turns up with her husband, and is like, "Oh, I just wanted to wish you luck." And then Jim goes off with them to watch the show from the side of the stage, and they go on and do the show, and it's amazing, and they recreate the entire fucking twenty minutes of it. And uh, I mean, you can see where the good ideas are in this. Yeah. But it's just so... And bear in mind, this is so like... So by the numbers. This is all in the last half and... hour of the film. Yeah. So it's taken so... This is a two-hour film. It's taken so long to get here. Yeah. And then they just rush through it all. They rush through all the Jim Hutton stuff. The, never mind the fact that he didn't actually settle down with Jim Hutton until after Live Aid because yeah. he was still with Paul Prentice during Live Aid. Yeah. Whereas in this, they make it out like Paul Prentice actively hid Live Aid from him. What, from Freddy? Yeah. Like he was getting, like he's getting phone calls from Jim Beach, Jim, and Jim's going, "Well, I've had this thing, this offer from from for this charity concert to get Queen back together, um, to play to what? play it, uh, but they're in Berlin and he's doing his solo album and they're just partying and, and we've got to get Queen Paul, back together. What do you mean back together? Paul's <laughs> in the corner at, the, at this party, being oh like, oh yeah, I'll definitely tell him, I'll definitely let him know you called.' And then just like, oh, I was no one. And he's doing the same thing to Mary Austin, of course. When Mary Austin turns up, it's a big surprise, and um. Like what the fuck? And then and then you get the the sort of um where are they now ending of Oh piss off Freddie Mercury no, died no, from H- no. From pneumonia Oh my god as a, as a complication of HIV in nineteen ninety two He spent the rest of his days in a loving relationship with Jim Mutton <laughs> And he, he was he was cremated in accordance with his family's Austrian beliefs in, on this date and whenever and stuff like that. And they do not. They end. do. Oh my god. They fucking do, man. Fucking do. What the fuck does it say about John Deacon? Uh, doesn't. They do, they just, doesn't. They, doesn't they, say they just, what happened to him. They just do it for Freddy. They just do it for Freddy. Yeah. Even though this whole thing sounds like it's some creepy ego trip for Brian and Roger. Yeah, because, it, like I say, they make Freddy like, like the bad guy, like he's the guy who broke up Queen. Even though Queen never broke up! Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> it's just fucking nuts! I wonder why freaking Ben Wishaw decided not to do the movie. I have issues with the script. I have issues with the script as well! The script is fucking awful. I can, and to- the I can totally understand Rami Malek as a career move wanting to do this because the guy's breaking out into bigger and bigger yeah, stuff. And, and it was and, a, ch- you know, a chance to play. It's like I say, he's, his performance, the energy he gives into this is, is stunning. But this material is just so lacking. Hmm. They, they've had to invent so much to give it the... to tell the story that they want it. Clearly, this film has an agenda. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Well, it's and superficial it's, agenda is to sell Queen records. Yeah, exactly. But... They make they almost villainize and they definitely villain. I don't know to what degree Paul Prentice it was a villain, if he was at all. But they absolutely make it because they have certainly a again, controversial figure. I don't know if this happened, but they have him on TV not long before Live Aid, talking a, like doing doing a, like a tell all interview right. about how much of a, about how much of a bastard Freddie was and how much of a hedonist and how he was, you know, and how he was and he was like, oh yeah, yeah. the lovers were countless. Are the rest and like basically just dropping him in the shit? Are the rest of the band completely absent from Freddie's party lifestyle? There's a moment like what the one of the big first party you've seen so in the trailer where he's walking around in the crown and cape. Yeah, that's like the first big party he throws at his house. Is also where he meets Jim Horton. Um because Jim Horton's working as a waiter at it. Mm. Uh, they they turn up 
and they're like oh yeah it's not really our speed Fred uh, 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 uh. I mean, oh, you've got wife and kids now we've got to get on to the wife and kids wow that's <laughs> okay and uh okay and that's... then he's like oh, yes, you know because they it. didn't take part in any of yeah. the stuff yeah and um and also Roger Taylor they, none of them like Paul but Roger Taylor in particular is very antagonistic with Paul Prentice this is the story they really wanted to tell, isn't it? Yeah, I think This so. is the story they wanted to tell. Yeah. And this is the story somebody decided to do the screenwriting for. And, and this is the story that Brian just... Singer and, and others went, yep, yeah, we'll tell this. And listen, I get I get, I get that biopics are fictionalised. I understand that. But there's such an extent of fictionalisation in this. And it feels like they deliberately done it to paint Freddie as some kind of antagonist and certainly Paul Prentice as some kind of antagonist again I don't know enough about the relationship to say whether he was an antagonist of any kind but it, it just left a bad taste in my mouth to be honest that is so it's weird that, like you say biopics are by their very nature fiction also it's boring but they're fiction based on fascinating real things like there's, there is there is just and, that um, rhythm like they sort of need to be like to me the biopic balance should be about 70 percent genuine recollection and representation of the stuff that happened yeah and 30 percent wiggle room to shift and recontextualize enough so that it works as a narrative for a motion picture yeah um the upcoming rocket man looks like it's sort of doing that even more in that yeah. it's, it's a biopic of part of elton john's life and work rocket man but directed by dexter fletcher okay yeah that trailer for it yeah looks like it has more visual flair than the entirety of this film well they've, they've said for that it's it's a fantasy biopic yeah. like it on it from the start it's a true this, fantasy is the yeah. tagline it's got yeah so it, it's like a it's like basically like a giant music video in that it's gonna be this visual nonsense and, and embrace the style and the music and tell the story through the music whereas this is telling the story and Using it as an excuse to sell some more music. And it's just yeah, the, the rhythm of it, like I say. I love Queen, so this start, is really sort of gross to me. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're in a studio recording this song, and then they release this song, and then there's a, like a montage of them playing it on tour, and, uh, and it's just like all the recreated live performances are just so flat. What's the point? Just release a documentary. Yeah. It, it, like if you're gonna if you're gonna recreate the live performances so much, just release a feature length documentary. Do it, they do it a lot. They do a lot of it. Like they they show them doing. Like they show they show that moment in the studio, a bit, but they place it about three years too early. Of of Brian May coming up with "We Will Rock You" and explaining it as a song for the audience to perform. But right. Freddie's running late to rehearsal because he's so troubled, so he doesn't come. He doesn't come in till after Brian's already got everyone and their wives because all the wives are at the studio up on the drum riser doing the stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, yeah. stomp, clap. And then Freddie comes in. And is like, "What's going on? Uh, what's who's doing this without me?" Um, but he's already got his short hair and moustache, which he didn't have until after the song, until after the song was written and played on tour. Yeah, I was going to say, we were Rocky, which album? Is, that is... Uh, News of the World? News of the World, yeah. Four, fifth, album? Fifth, fifth or album. six. It's, it's the one before Night of the Opera. I don't know, I thought Sheer Heart Attack was the third one. I'm, I'm going to have to look this up. It's Queen, I'm confusing myself. Queen, Queen 2, Sheer Heart Attack, News of the World, Night of the Opera, Day at the Races, Jazz... Hot Space, The Game, The Works. Hang on. Oh, well, yeah, I'm trying to just get the... I could oh, be wrong. The Prophet song so good as well. Sorry, I'm just, random, I'm just randomly seeing the Prophet song written down again. That's made me really so happy. You don't get, you don't get anything of... Um, you don't get anything past, past Live Aid, so you don't get him struggling in the studio to record innuendo mm. and get that out and then the stuff that would later become made in heaven. Well, we were chatting about this before the um, before the recording that there are two periods of Freddie Mercury's life. If you're going to focus the story on Freddie, which yeah. you should, like no offence to John, Roger and Brian, but like that's the, the theatrical story to me. Yeah. It's the stuff you could tell about Freddie's life. There are two periods you focus on. Yeah. You focus on his early life leading up to say Bohemian Rhapsody and make that your like oh, no, News of the World was after Day of the Races my mistake sorry it's a, it's a Queen Queen 2 Sheer Heart Attack Night the Opera Day of the Races News of the World um, and then after that is when his appearance starts to to change like he sort of goes through the big sweep that is then the look he retains yeah. 
for the remainder. Oh, they of the don't 80s. mention anything about like the Flash Gordon soundtrack or their involvement with Highlander or anything like that. So they don't like even though Flash Queen. would be perfect. Yeah. Flash would be perfect. They don't mention Queen getting into the movies. Christ, but you either tell the story of Freddie's early life and you make Bohemian Rhapsody in that period of early Queen the finale. Yeah. But then you f- then you forsake a visual that a lot of the world is associated with of like the Live Aid era kind of version of the band. But that's fine. Like this story, the story of like his family and their immigration and, and like the fact that he's, you know, like his different nationalities and like his upbringing. Yeah. You really focus on that. Bring his sexuality forward a little you bit because position, you can play though. with that stuff. Oh, as I'm saying, but you could you, you, get, do, you, get you a, could do oh, that. My family left under oh, yeah. persecution. And but you could, came to enough, but you could do that as a film. Like that would work great as a film and, yeah. and itself. Um, it's a proper underdog story. Or you tell the story of Live Aid onwards. Like, you have it be, look at this brilliant moment, isn't this great? I'm, I'm on top, top of the, the world, world. And then I find out I'm dying. Diagnosis. And you yeah. tell that story because what happens next is so... It's beautiful and it's upsetting. And just the way that like he handles it. The, the way yeah. he handled it and, and handled his own mortality. And he the didn't. fact that he gets to a point where he knows this is it. He didn't publicly confirm that he had AIDS until the day before he died. Yeah. The only the only visual cue, the only thing we had were visual cues. The fact that he was you looking You could see really him sick. looking smaller and smaller. It's in the days of our lives video. He just yeah, looks... it, it, specifically the videos for um I'm going slightly mad in Days of Our Lives. These are the oh, Days of Our Lives. It's hard. Where you're like, oh my god! But at no point in the video does he behave like an unwell man. Like he's no. full showmanship. It's there. But he, I mean, for Christ's sake, he leaves a message to everyone in that song. Yeah, the, the, looks down the barrel of the camera and says, "I still love you." And it's oh, it's gorgeous. Like, it's it's so amazing. Good. And in you end up like for me, in you end up my favorite album. It's not necessarily to do with the story behind it, but the story behind it is fascinating in terms of like where he was and what he was doing and how he was feeling, what he was going through, and what the rest of them were going through. Coming to terms with the idea that we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do this. Like on the purely selfish thing of as a band, we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do this. Yeah. Like scared for him, but at the same time, delighted that he's still going on like, and still working with them. There's to so the point much... where like they do made in release made in heaven in what 95, because there was yeah. that much stuff they were still working on because there was that vibe of, well, we're not going to stop, but I know that I'm going to have to at some point. He just point kept soon. going until he dropped. And that, I love that album. I love that. I love Innuendo so much as an album. And and that undercurrent is a big part of why. Yeah. Um, that story would be fascinating. And then you could get into the idea of the other people he knew and the other people he we know that he slept with or allegedly slept with or spent time with in, in you know sexual context because there was that culture. Like the late 80s was when the world finally freaking like learned about HIV and yeah. AIDS and the different things and the different fallouts and you know what was what was preventable and and the cultural impact that had and like the AIDS scare and everything like you could really touch on that story yeah and what they've chosen to do here is they've chosen to tell the origin story of the band knowing he's the most fascinating sort of story to follow as as your main narrative but then chicken out on that they've just done it in the least interesting way possible yeah it's dull. There's a story I'm really bored of in film story structure. It's called The Liar Revealed. Yeah. And it, it, it very much heavily plays on the um, on the, the hero should be at their weakest point at the end of Act 2 story structure. And it's usually hero is one thing, hero is one thing, hero is mistaken for one thing, hero continues to be that thing because it's the right thing for them either selfishly or for the people that are relying on them. Mm-hmm. The hero, usually revealed by the antagonistic force, is revealed to be a lie, a sham. It's not true. <laughs> Everyone throws them out. That's the lowest point for the movie. The antagonistic force takes control of the narrative. And then the protagonist comes back and proves that they are at least the thing everyone believed they are. Or, or they are that good and wraps the story up. Well done. And You've just written Bohemian Rhapsody. But, but exactly, like it's it's a played out story. We've seen it a million times. I mean, off the top of, off the top of your head, I bet you could name a film like that. I can name two immediately: Oz the Great and Powerful, A Bug's Life. There's two immediately off the top of my head Toy that story. follow that. Toy Story, <laughs> exactly. But do you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it's it's a done plot. Like it's been 
done. The Lion King, like they're sort of reversion revisions of it in some yeah. way. I mean, obviously, The Lion King is based on something else more significantly, but in terms of its story I mean, structure as a film, like it, a lot of films go along with this thing, and it's it's fine. It's a story structure, and the problem for me is not but that it really, does that, but it's really dull. But it, it, the problem why would for me you is that... put it on a biopic. Why would you yeah. make a bi- Why would you make a villain? The problem in for a me, biopic. The problem for me is not that it. Fo- it's not that it follows that structure. Is that it has to twist real life so far out of whack to, 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 fit, to, fit to make that. it fit yeah. that structure yeah um, when just, uh, if you do a cursory bit of research you'll know that that's not how it went down so many websites have put out this past week articles about I was looking at one before on Screen Rant because um, occasionally they write something uh, uh, and it it's researched uh, but what and the th- I know it's weird. The thumbnail for the article wasn't a picture of Elastigirl with a red circle and an arrow around what? it. What? Um, anyway, no red circles, <laughs> no arrows. <laughs> Fucking hell! It's a new internet movement. This can't be true. Um, <laughs> if but you just yeah, like like you say, just have a look at the internet right now. There are so many pieces out at the moment about what's misrepresented or warped mm. in Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, a fr- friend of the show, uh, Paul Holmes of Velvet Onion, um, spoke on his personal Facebook the other day. He sort of listed every inconsistency and how much it bothers him. Like, starting at the ones where it's like, fine, I get it, it's a movie, they've tweaked up a structure. Right down to, you are fundamentally missing the point of this person's message and warping it beyond belief for something that doesn't work. Um, I'm kind of glad I've not seen it. I'll be honest. You've 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 done another iron fist, Matt. Yeah. You've taken the bullet. You've taken the The Only and Limitless card is a wonderful thing. Yeah, that that's I'll be honest, that's the only reason I might see it while I'm in Panto Land if it's still playing in that You, you might enjoy it. People might. have been enjoying it. I might. I'm pretty sure we've got at least one email about how about how someone who enjoyed it. Like um, I, indeed I might, but I think I'm too much of a Queen fan to not be upset with a lot of its decisions do you know what i mean like in the same way a lot of people go oh i love the greatest showman and i'm like i i can't watch it because i can't watch something that glorifies pt barnum yeah and people that's are like, the thing that's yeah, but, me off but it. it's not pt barnum it's like a fictional version of him and i'm like yeah but it's using his name yeah and in the big world of like pop culture and people who don't do the further reading and stuff because they shouldn't have to it's a movie like they're there to enjoy the movie and the escapism of the film they will then just go oh yeah he's great P.T. Barnum was wonderful. It's like, he fucking wasn't. Like, he really was not a nice person. Um, do you know, I mean, for Christ's sake, the guy coined the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. Yeah. That's him. <laughs> like, that's yeah. his phrase. Gah! Barnum was a bad dude. Bad motherfucker. Like, he, he toured an elderly black woman as an exhibit because he, he but, claimed that she was, like, somebody's servant, like, somebody significant... Fuck off. Oh, and also the pop songs for that film are boring shit. But anyway, the point is... The point is, this is me! In the context of that movie, they're ridiculous and they don't work. And it's stupid. And really poppy. Like, put it somewhere else. Fair enough. In that, it's weird. Because it's trying to make it feel like that is... Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yay, anthem for the for the freaks. We're this, that, and the other. And it's like, yes, it's an empowering song. But, uh... You guys aren't empowered. You are literally his his assets. That's all you are. No, we're in it together. In this movie, you may be. But the real life story, you're really not. Yeah. Anyway, but it's just that whole thing of like, I, I, it makes me feel really sad when films, biopics or films based on people do that. Because that's what people will take away from it. Yeah. And I yeah. feel that's going to be the case. I mean, that's Patch Adams, another example. Grossly misrepresents the life of that guy. <laughs> grossly misrepresents it. But you say to someone... Are you aware of Patch Adams? They're like, oh yeah, Robin Williams played him. Didn't he? He's got like the clown nose and it's really funny. It's like, no. 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 Like, That's go and look happened. into the history of this guy's, like, freaking medicinal practices and charities and drives and organizations. This man has done a lot of good in the world for medical practices and people's, like, mental states. It is not this. It is not a courtroom with a bunch of kids rocking up at the end to be like, but he's a good man. It's like, bullshit. <laughs> so sacred. But it's, uh, it upsets me that Bohemian Rhapsody will do that for a lot of people. For those who just enjoy the escapism, power to you. I think I would dissect it way too much. It's boring though. Like it's not even fun. 
Can you tell a distinct directorial shift during portions of it? Or no, does it, it all feel like, like the same film? It just feels like a bit of a mess. Oh. Maybe because it is shifting and it's just sort of... sloppy editing, I think. Mm. But apparently, Dexter Fletcher only finished the last couple of weeks and then oversaw post. So, <laughs> Which is a large portion of the director's job, really. Because hey. like, that's the thing. It's the director's vision and all the while they're doing it, in the back of their head, they're already picturing what they're going to do in the edit. So that's a lot of work to, to do the post side of it because you're having to dissect what Brian Singer would have planned for I don't think he was scenes. picturing the edit. I think he was just picturing his next victim. <laughs> Brian oh, Singer we're talking about. Yeah. Brian Singer. Brian yeah, Singer. No, that's the He's a horrible man. Um, Speaking of horrible men... He's not even a good director. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the usual suspect. No, let's get into some emails. <laughs> Speaking of horrible men... Oh yeah, he's just a beginner's look. And that's what I call it. Um... <laughs> This one comes in from Bryn. Um, Hi, Bryn. Who says, hello, big damn cast. Hello, Bryn. I've recently discovered your podcast and listened to a few of your more recent episodes. So I thought before it becomes too absurdly long in the past, I'd take you up on the offer at the end of episode 119 Ooh. to share my favourite classic Who series. Hey, Doctor this has been an ongoing thread. My top three are Marco Polo, Survival, and The War Games. Nice. Out of interest, Bryn. How are you digesting Marco Polo? Marco Polo? Yeah. Because that fucking loose cannon uh, recon is <laughs> long. Um, <laughs> with honourable mentions to remember. He's definitely in a caravan and not an actual caravan. Yes. Uh, with honourable mentions to remember of the Daleks, the Rescue and the Time Meddler, plus Shadow if that counts. Wow, so you're, you're a pretty big fan of the, of the early 60s stuff and the McCoy era awesome. by the read of it. That's pretty cool. Um, I've, enjoyed nice listen- I've enjoyed listening to the few episodes I have and hope to listen to more in the future. I, I hope you do as well. Uh, I've always enjoyed your work, Chris Johnson, <laughs> on the Time Team, Five Who Fans, and also moderating the panels at the Attic SJH and Anniversary Con, which I attended. Oh, and it's nice to much. discover that you have an enjoyable podcast with such an amusing co-host. I'm amusing. Excellent. <laughs> You're amusing. The amusing Matt Watson. As long as I'm not boring, that's all right. Um, as Guy Lambert pointed out on your most recent podcast that all your emailers were male, I feel it's worth mentioning that I can slightly redress that balance as I'm feminine presenting non-binary person who uses they and them pronouns. Nice. Um, research, up, research. We're research, doing this for the survey. Research. research. Uh, keep up the good work. Bryn. Thanks for that, Bryn. Thank um, you so much, Bryn. I'm not keeping score or anything. It's just as, as two people who are in positions of relative privilege but are interested in diversity, it's nice to know if we're reaching a more diverse audience, basically. Yeah. Because um, YouTube analytics can only tell you so much. Exactly. So, um, you know. But yes. Thank you very much, Bryn. Thank you, Bryn. I really, um, I really hope that after the Sarah Jane Adventures panels, you won't put off after listening to a couple more big dumb casts by how much I swear. Oh, so much swearing. <laughs> um... <laughs> So much. Better. This is this is to be this, fair. This is me. Oh, 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 oh. I, this is how the, I just am like this. I do most of the swears. Um, That's true. That's true. Uh, this one. <laughs> it's a shameless plug. Uh, this one comes in from Johnny Taylor. He says, "Hello there, big damn boys. Hi, JT and me? the Tennessee kids. Me and my mate Paul. I know a lot, of Pauls." Be more specific. I've just started a podcast which is heavily inspired by this here thing, what you're recording right now. Oh, yeah. We yay. have no budget, same. same. No following, same. Yeah, yeah. And no experience, same. same. Uh, <laughs> but we decided to have a go anyway. It's called Mastercast. Ooh. And it's available on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Castbox at Mastercast Official. And we have a Twitter at the underscore master underscore cast. Hashtag shameless plug. Um, regarding this, I thought I'd ask you about why you started your podcast. What has kept you doing it for this long? And do you have any tips for longevity and sustainability for our podcast? All the best. Johnny Taylor. Johnny well, Taylor, what's it called? Mastercast. Mastercast. That's a great name for Mastercast. a podcast. Mastercast. Oh, Loving that. Um, not alliteration. Uh, what's it called? Just sort of choice of word. It sort of bounces. It flows. It's got the same vowel sounds. Um, Synonym? No. no. Uh, uh, oh, you know what I mean. Um, lo- lovely noise. Lovely noise. It's a lovely um, noise. Yes, uh, t- it's for- it's a lovely noise. And I haven't got the thing. I can't. I can't pop the balloon. There it is. Oh, <laughs> it's a lovely noise. Hey, oh, that was um, a I'm just squeezing all the air out of this one very slowly. For those who are wondering, um, there's a lot of balloons in here, and, and I was going to use them for a skit, and I'm using them for some green screen stuff, but they've just been here, so I'm slowly popping them over the recording I'm, of this podcast. I'm, I'm really enjoying them. I'm really enjoying squeezing the balloons. Um, oh. There we go. I think we've covered a bit of why we started this podcast in our live episode, yeah, mostly. Yeah, which was just episode 104. 104. 104. 104. Well, yeah, we sort of give potted history. Um, maybe. That, so was, that was 20 whole episodes ago, for crying out loud. It was. Um, oh my god. I know. It was 20 weeks ago. Hell. Um Speeding uh, towards the grave at this just, point. Just keeping ourselves sane. <laughs> That's the worst thing about doing a podcast. Basically. You realise how quickly you are aging. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, Stop reminding me. Uh, oh God! As two performers who aren't getting a lot of performing work, it was just a way to make something of our own. Yeah, and keep ourselves in practice yeah. and in an industry where you don't really get any modicum of control over your sort of destiny or over what you can do with your skill set it's nice to have a little pocket yeah where we it's ours and it's both, our little baby and we both have other outlets that we do uh, separately but the big damn projects are the things that we do together because we've always kind of wanted to do stuff together because we've been friends for so long and we're both performers and it's also lovely types. it's also lovely to have an excuse for an appointment each week yeah. where we know no matter what's going on in the week we're going to get to spend some time together yeah, shooting the shit we, like we, we normally do. Otherwise see each other. And yeah. it, uh, it's nice to spend time with the people who you care about in your life. Because I think that's the thing um, as well. Aww, no. you soppy bastard! Aww. But that's the thing as well. Is that a lot of people you know, might go like, oh, so what? You, you're just talking about these things because like, it's a podcast. It's like, no, we shoot yeah. the shit about this stuff all the yeah. time. And one day we went, why aren't we just putting we, a microphone we on? We have so much fun <laughs> talking about it that we hope some people can have some fun listening to us talk about yeah. it and, and obviously having fun. Um, so that's kind of why rolled round and as for longevity and sustainability we just keep doing it yeah we keep doing it to keep ourselves sane yeah because if we don't do it then we don't then we might not do anything like if you have a core if you have a creative and consistent core output of something then uh, for me at least i find it easier to do other things and if it's, you know it's training in a way as yeah. well like if you know yeah. you're doing something that's getting in front of some people uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that our, our following isn't growing as much as I'd like, but people are listening to it, like yourself, mm. and people are emailing in with kind of stuff all the time, and, you know, we're definitely reaching an audience, so that, it helps with motivation on other projects, and that's that's why we keep doing it, um, and, I'll, and I'll keep doing it until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And then we'll do Live Aid. <laughs> We'll break up for yeah. uh, for fictional reasons for for what's implied to be like well over a year if not longer, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> we'll get our manager to get us back together for a meeting, and yeah. then we'll do Live Aid. Um, <laughs> but we haven't played together for so long. You've just been a fucking tall. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's in love with his car. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a running joke that they keep taking the piss out of Roger Taylor for writing I'm in love with my car because he's convinced that it deserves a place on Night of the Opera, which it got. Yeah. Um, but everyone's it's, just it's, saying... It's a fun song, like, I he like gets, it. He gets into an argument with uh, Brian and Roger in the kitchen, which is played for laughs, mm. in the kitchen where he's, he just starts throwing things at them and then he picks up the coffee machine and they both go, NOT THE COFFEE MACHINE! It's very funny. It's oh. very funny. And then oh. the guy, the, the Michael Myers record exec character is like, what about I'm in love with my car? That's a great song. People can that's a, that's a song that kids can turn up and bang their heads to in the car. No, it doesn't. That joke, that joke already is painful, but it doesn't work because that's not a song you can do that to. Listen, oh, Bohemian Rhapsody has an eight point four out of ten on IMDb. People like it. I'm glad they do. The problem is with us, Chris. Sounds bullshit, anyway. Though. This one comes in from Thanks Ryan. Very much. Thanks very much. Um, Ryan says, "Hey guys." Hey, Ryan! Been a while since my last email, but I've been enjoying listening to the podcast lately. Particularly nice to see Father Christmas back for the Halloween episode. (laughs) We know how to market our holidays. Uh, I wanted to email in to talk about a few things. Uh, First off, Inside Number 9 was awesome. It was, wasn't it? (coughs) I'm sorry, tickling the throat there. It was awesome. Uh, And I agree the bit that the whispering voice was pretty freaky. It was. Uh, Since I'm not much of a horror person, it took me a while to get through it because it kept freaking me out a lot. Love it! Also, wanted to say congrats to Chris and Lucy, and I hope you two have a wonderful life together. Oh, bless you. Uh, I've been enjoying your Doctor Who videos a lot, and I look forward to seeing you guys experience the highs and lows of the show as it goes on and on and on. <laughs> That's me adding that, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, charming. It goes on very long. <laughs> Not your videos, the show. So, we were in HMV yesterday, and I noticed that the, uh, the DVD box set for Series 10, which I've still not got yet, was 19 quid, Oy. and the DVD copy of Twice Upon a Time, which for completionist sake you have to buy that because it's not going to be in the series 11 box there yeah. was five quid and i said to lou i was like oh that's like i'll keep an eye on that but that looks like the cheapest option to get those stories at the minute like unless they drastically go down in price in like a couple of years time I think they're on Netflix. that's gonna be the cheapest well completionism's sake we're having to do it based on the dvd releases that was the rules oh, for okay. our thing okay. um and she went oh god we have to watch them at some point she said 
roughly how long will it be before we get to the oh, Capaldi era? We can really and I was like, probably about a year and a half from now in our in our marathon. Listen, Tom Tom's around for a while. <laughs> Hello. Tom's around for a <laughs> while. <laughs> um, Until I have to leave a mannequin to do a photo shoot for me. <laughs> <laughs> a dog screws up my face, but I still turn up. <laughs> <laughs> Currently. <laughs> Um, <laughs> currently, I've been reading. This Doctor- is Ryan's email. Yeah. Sorry, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> currently, I've been reading Doctor Who comics since I got a few cheap at both com- at both Comic Con and also from the charity shops where I live. Huzzah! Nice. Huzzah! Um, it I didn't was- pop. <laughs> Huzzah! I was wondering if there you guys have read any of the current Doctor Who Titan comics and whether you would have any good recommendations for ones to read. Hmm. Personally, I would highly recommend the third Doctor miniseries. It's the first one I've read so far. Then it only perfectly captures the characters, but also has a lot of fun with them. That's Paul, Paul really, Cornell did that one. That was quite good. Including a really good gag about the tea lady. If you like the third Doctor as much as I do, I'd highly recommend it. Huzzah! Um, Doctor Who comics. I've not read any of the <laughs> Titan stuff. <laughs> I've read some. I've read quite a big chunk of the, the first year or so. What um, do you like? I I sound like a stuck record at this point. I totally recommend picking up the four volumes of the Ninth Doctor. Um, Kevin Scott captures the voice perfectly. It's set between the Doctor dances and Boomtown. Oh, so it's Rose, the Doctor, and Captain Jack. The best, yes, the best. Team. It's, it's amazing. It's it's a really really good run, and I recommend it to everybody. Uh, Al Ewing's work on the Eleventh Doctor in that first year is great as well. Uh, 10th Doctor first year is pretty fun 10th Doctor and Gabby uh, make for an interesting TARDIS team um, a new companion yes where does it fit chronology wise 10th uh, Doctor where does it fit into the canon the 10th Doctor stuff fits in after the next Doctor I believe so it's it's in the specials year yes um, and the 11th Doctor stuff fits in during Amy and Rory's honeymoon their actual oh, honeymoon okay. I believe so like after Christmas Carol um, but before uh, Impossible Astronaut. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they make it weird. Um, okay. I didn't read a lot of Twelfth Doctor because I wasn't a big fan of Twelfth Doctor and Clara. But um, if you are somebody who really loves your comics for the visuals, Rachel Stott's work on the Twelfth Doctor run is gorgeous, uh, and I believe she's doing some of, if not the all of the Thirteenth Doctor's comic. So check them out; they're pretty good. Mm. The pretty fun. The Eighth Doctor miniseries was good as well. My only experience, <laughs> my, well, not my only, but my, my most of my experience with Doctor Who comics has been through the DWM strips, <laughs> going all the way back to the beginning, uh, thanks to my father's rather large collection of uh, original Doctor Who magazines. Um, all the so, way back, all the 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 way back. So those way back. early Fourth Doctor strips with Dave Gibbons. Um, mm, yeah, you've got some very weird. Um, who comes on? Uh, Grant Morrison Grant does Morrison's some stuff in it, the yeah. in the mid eighties with the Sixth Doctor. So, so what if what if the um, Doctor? It's Doctor Who, but we're actually dropping acid. <laughs> uh, so that's my that's my uh, that's my experience with Doctor Who comic, comics, and that stuff is a mixed bag. Yeah, a mixed ass bag. But uh, there's some gems. Here's one from your dad's collection, actually. That uh, oh yeah, he's lent to me. Um, What's this? It's a Marvel Comics one. Oh yes, because well, what happened was is, is, that, Mar- is it issue three? Of Doctor yes. Who. Yeah. So what what Marvel did because Marvel UK published the um, Doctor Who magazine. Yeah. Is they re-released? They collected the Look at that uh, logo. I know, right? Sexy, isn't it? The four. I think there were five or six pages in the in DWM of, of black and white strip. Mm-hmm. Is they collected those, coloured them. And then release them as normal size, like 22, 21 page American Marvel issues. comics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Logander's issue three. It's a good nick. This. Oh, the dogs of doom. <laughs> the warlocks attack. So yeah, this is Dave Gibbons' art. Oh god, um, this smells of old comic, and I love with, it. With uh, the look at him. Oh, he's yeah. all feral. It's the one where uh, the Doctor turns into a werewolf. <laughs> good <laughs> lord, my thing. hands. <laughs> and it's Sharon's the companion, who's. Uh, a young lassie picks up in Birmingham, who's, but then she ages later on. Like, oh, and the so, Daleks are in yeah, it for so reasons. She, start, she starts off as a teenager. Oh, throwback, Soul of a Cyberman. Brilliant. Yeah, it had backup strips as well, which were like sci-fi stuff without the Doctor in, which had... Um, what do you call it? Which tended to focus on a, a, an enemy of the Doctor. 
Yeah. Or the oh. final quest, that's the Sontaran one. Is that the one with the Deathsmiths of Goth? I think it is. It might be. Um, My God, your memory for this stuff's incredible. Uh, Sontaran waking up from a bad dream. Ah, uh, the dream again! <laughs> Girl. Um, Get them scary sharp teeth as well for reasons. Oh, hello. Oh, meat. Because no one knows how to draw things. Um. <laughs> yes. A mighty warrior tricked by the most peaceful people in the galaxy. <laughs> oh yeah, they get introduced and and uh, <laughs> exited by uh, the fourth Doctor. Um, That's he used weird. To, he used to send a letter to each issue of, of DWM as well. Fourth Doctor, Doctor. Who weekly as it was was then. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Even though I went back when it when it first started and it was the fourth Doctor. Yeah. Sort of. Okay. I was there was, say, a, there was they, a letter this, from the Doctor in every issue. Because this comic, that, that comic we just looked at, is from the the Colin era of the show, and no, the fourth that's, doc- that's that's from the. Oh no, but I mean it, it was released during the Colin era because the bat on the back pages there was stuff oh, about yeah, but the Sixth the, Doctor. It's yeah. a collection of a strip that was originally released yeah. in the fourth. But it's Doctor so era weird that even comic, even yeah. then it's like, oh, you know, Doctor Who. It's this guy. Well, because, <laughs> because it's, it's a reprint. Yeah. It's from. But it's just it's, because of that. It sort of fits into the weird sort of cultural thing that existed. Long after of Doctor Who, that's the guy with yeah. the scarf, right? So that's that's my oh, Doctor forget Who. Forget the other guys. <laughs> comics experience, and let me tell you, it is a mixed bag. But Frobish is cool. Frobish um, is great. I've got some of the six Doctor strips of Frobish. There's in the omnibus, the white thick one on the shelf. Oh, the short volume. Uh, that might have the world shapers in it, you know. It could do. Which is the Grant Morrison stuff. I'll have a look in a sec. Meets, meets, meets. Speaking of Doctor Who, I think my top three classic stories Aye. of what I've seen so far would be <clears throat> The Keys of Marinus at number three. I have a lot a of A nice adventure one. story that has some interesting variety in locations and antagonists, as well as actually having some pretty enjoyable side characters too. And two weeks off for Billy. He <laughs> was off for two weeks and puts number, his feet up. Number two, The Three Doctors. Yeah. It's a lot of fun and also manages to have a villain who is both interesting and threatening in spite of the fact that he lives with the big orange bubble monsters. Very true. It's all right. Um, After that, he goes on to live with um, uh, 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 an Auton and a Drashig. Yeah, in a flat. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always Omega. Uh, number, <laughs> number one, the five Doctors. Not necessarily the best story. You can say that again. Not necessarily um, the best story. But it's so fun that it's hard not to love. Yeah. Also, I like to refer to this the way David Tennant does in the commentary for it. <laughs> yes. The three and a half Doctors and a bloke in a white wig. Yes. Yes. Honourable mentions. Yes. Remembrance of the Daleks, Tomb of the Cybermen, The Time Warrior, Robot, Claws of Axos, The Time Meddler, and Shada! Uh, that's all for now, guys. Take care. Thank you, Ryan. Um, okay, uh, this next one comes in from Jacob. Hello. Jacob. Uh, <laughs> so that was. Hello. Jacob. Evening. The big damn cockers. Oh, how did you know? Because the crowd went, whoa. Uh, I'm too tired to waffle on today, but I just wanted to say I enjoyed <laughs> Doctor Who and this somehow week. somehow your email is also tired. I know, right? <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I enjoyed Doctor Who this week, so we started just talking about the Sranga Conundrum. Um, I don't particularly understand all the hate for it. There was a lot of talking, but that's what I enjoyed about it. Particularly like the Doctor's speech about what she's a Doctor of. Especially the part where she mentions Lego and she ends up deciding she's a Doctor of Hope. Before I go, I want to mention something I watched for the first time. I watched Torchwood, Children of Earth. Ooh. It was fucking brilliant. It, it was is. probably some of the best television I've ever seen. Hmm. What are your thoughts on it? That's for now. That's it for now, I should say. Sarah right, Jacob. <laughs> what was it called? Um, the Saranga Conundrum. Saranga Conundrum. I, I, I thought it was really dull. We've not actually talked about this one. I thought I, it was really dull. I liked it. I, I thought I didn't hate it, but I, thought, I was just a bit bored by I it. I thought the Pating was a really neat, cute monster. Hmm? I love the big CGI was gorgeous. I love the big content look on its face when it gets blown out of the airlock with an antimatter bomb in its stomach. It looks so happy. <laughs> I like the moment where the Doctor was just listing like what she's a Doctor of. Yeah, that was cute. Doctor as hell. of Hope is a great because it was it was funny. It was it was played for character. laughs, and then she said that at the end. Yeah. You're like, oh. Oh. I thought it was neat. I thought all the, all, I thought it was sort of some neat side characters in it. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this week's. I mean, yeah. I it's it's my it, it's my it, it's my second least favorite episode of this series so far. But when they're all when there's five of them so far only, and they've all been pretty entertaining. That's yeah. not that doesn't mean it's terrible telly. I just was a bit bored by it. I cannot say it was bad. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I enjoyed. I enjoyed a lot. Um, Graham's a big fan of. Call the midwife. <laughs> <It's> fucking. 
<laughs> Graham continues to be my favourite companion. Yes, yeah. Every that opening week. shot was gorgeous as well, just like lowering down on the trash planet. Yeah. And you start to know, you're like, oh, there's Ryan over there. And yeah. you, sort of, like, you can see them all on different mounds. That was quite fun. Yeah. Um, and, all, and all continuing to get a bit of character development as well, which is nice. Yeah. Actually developing the companions, not just giving them skills necessary for that week's story. That's why I'm excited um, for um, Demons of the Punjab. Because yes. it, it's, it's the idea of Yaz not going back into her recent history, which we have done on the show. Yeah, but her ancestry. It's like, I want to go back to my ancestry. It's like, that's an interesting idea. Let's yes. do it. So that'd be cool. And also, the show confronting more social issues in a more obvious and blatant way. Yeah. Love it. Keep doing it. I love it when you piss people off. Because if people Science fiction shouldn't be about this. I'm sorry. You're the Science same, fiction you the same people has who, nearly always been about Are you the that? same people who also like shit like 1984 and June and Star Trek, the original series, and Star Trek, the next generation and things like that? You know, these right. are the things which you say are really good and stuff. Like, you know, they do the same thing. They just don't happen to be hurting your current sensibilities. I've said it you many times. Annoyed people. Oh. Well, sci-fi is often at its best when it's used as social commentary. Um, Children of Earth. How do we feel about Children of Earth? It's I very, love it's, it's, it's the best Torchwood thing. I, I would, I might even go so far as to say it's the only good Torchwood thing. I would counteract that. Um, <laughs> because even as someone who's not a big fan of Torchwood, you must agree, Stolen Earth and Journey's End, Doctor Who, uh, is only as spectacular as it is because of the inclusion of the two spin-offs for which Torchwood has to exist to work. Ha ha ha! Yes! Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! <laughs> ah, ha, ha, ha. Um, I don't know what that was. Um, okay, I really love Children of Earth. I adore it. It's one of my favourite bits of telly from the two thousands, and I think it's it's up there. Where, I know it wasn't. I think it was, I can't remember if it was entirely Russell or if it's Russell and some other people who wrote that series. But it's up there with like Second Coming for me in terms of his work. Oh, Second like, Coming's really good. Yeah. Like just that idea of like a TV, like things like Bob and Rose and stuff. It was like a TV event. It's like. A few episodes of a thing that played within a week or a couple of weeks, a and was just, from and was just superb. Like that's and the best way to watch Children of Earth is to watch one a night for five nights in a row. That's the best way to watch it because it you find yourself going. Oh, Wasn't that Christ, was transmitted? Going? Yeah, uh, Monday through Friday on BBC yeah. One, Thought which was, was a bold thing. They wanted to spread it out over five weeks, and they were like, "Nope, five days, five days. It has to be like a countdown. I think people have to watch day by day." You've got to treat it like something like quite a mass or whatever, where there's like you know it's a serialized like you've know, got to tune in for the next part tonight. Um, Remember when they remade Quite a Mass with David Tennant live? Yeah, and it it didn't work out tremendously well, but it but it was it was it was really warm and cozy because it was clearly some of the older people participating in it loved and believed in. Yeah. So it was really enjoyable to watch. I remember there's a, I can't remember where it's unlike was, Bohemian Rhapsody. There's a cock up at one. <laughs> I was going to say there's a cock up <laughs> at one point. I'm glad I said that after you said I'm not going to be Um Hi all. <laughs> this next email comes in from um, the end of the show. The end of the show. <laughs> Thank you all for bowing before our Majesty. Please leave tributes at the door. But uh, yes. furthermore from that, if you could and you enjoy the show, let people know. Spread the word. Big damn cast. It can only get bigger if you cast it. Damn you. You can also hit us up on Twitter during the week at Big Damn Cast. <laughs> Give us a follow on uh, twitch.tv slash Big Damn Stream if you're up for some live game streaming from either the Big Damn Stream itself oh, or from my own Matt's channels. Uh, you can also get in touch with us anytime you like. Big Damn Contact at gmail.com. That's Big Damn Contact at gmail.com. Uh, and of course, follow us on iTunes and YouTube if you aren't already. Uh, anything else? Um, uh, they've got a, the, the Shadow antidote. of the Colossus has begun on uh, yes. the backlog in, so... That's going to be quite a quick one. Uh, maybe. Um, uh, the second episode will have gone up the day before this comes out, uh, and that will leave me at three Colossi down and nine to go. You smashed Arkham in like nine hours. I did not expect to finish Arkham that quickly. It was on amazing. Hard mode it was well. really, really good. Just like, boom, plow. I didn't spend a lot of time going off after Riddler stuff, so. Uh, but I didn't. Also, the, also, on second playthrough, you know where a load of it is. So you yeah. do it with all three. Well, the ending stuff. snuck up on me because I did the I did the Harley fight, the, not the Harley fight, the Ivy fight. Yeah, I was like, okay, that's that's, that's that done. Oh, that's, end of Act Two. Oh wait, no, no that's it's, just it's the end it's, of the game. It's like the end of Act Three. Okay, oh, it's packed. I'll just go and do this then. <laughs> Fuck it. Let's end it here. Um, Once so, the fireworks yeah. start, you're like, oh, we're here already? Yeah. I was oh, like, okay. oh, I, I'm sure there was more of that. Mainly because Kanisha's continually tried to play Arkham Asylum and always given up at the Ivy fight. 
I always had trouble with it and just giving up at the Ivy fight. Yeah, I got I got stuck and on like, it on my. You know how close that is to the end. On my on my second playthrough of the game, like when I replayed it just ahead of Arkham City coming out. Yeah. I got stuck at that and I couldn't do it, and it, it took handing the controller to Lou and her like playing it a couple times for them beat it and go there you go something the controller well, was like you, god damn it <laughs> you can see exactly how long it takes me on the YouTube <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world um, but yeah so please do come over to the channel big of the damn channel. Um, I think we're at that point YouTube now where if you search the... big damn channel on YouTube the first result is now actually our channel hey considering that's the name of the fucking channel please leave a comment telling me how to beat Shadow of the Colossus because I have a feeling I'm going to get stuck uh, speaking of stuck I'm not win this. Um, it's pop a balloon. This one looks like a light bulb now. Well, that's too cute to I've pop. Squeezed all the air out of it. It's too um, cute to pop. Oh, I've got two here. Ah, okay. fantastic! Ah, my fingers.